Martin Chuzzlewit, Chapter Forty Eight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens, Chapter Forty Eight. Bears tidings of Martin and of Mark, as well as of a third person not quite unknown to the reader. Exhibits filial piety in an ugly aspect and casts a doubtful ray of light upon a very dark place. Tom Pinch and Ruth were sitting at their early breakfast with the window open, and a row of the freshest little plants ranged before it on the inside by Ruth's own hands, and Ruth had fastened a sprig of geranium in Tom's buttonhole to make him very smart and summer-like for the day. It was obliged to be fastened in, or that dear old Tom was certain to lose it and people were crying flowers up and down the street, and a blundering bee who had got himself in between the two sashes of the window was bruising his head against the glass, endeavouring to force himself out into the fine morning, and considering himself enchanted because he couldn't do it, and the morning was as fine a morning as ever was seen, and the fragrant air was kissing Ruth and rustling about Tom as if it said, "'How are you, my dears? I came all this way on purpose to salute you.' And it was one of those glad times when we form, or ought to form, the wish that every one on earth were able to be happy, and catching glimpses of the summer of the heart to feel the beauty of the summer of the year." It was an even pleasanter breakfast than usual, and it was always a pleasant one, for little Ruth had now two pupils to attend, each three times a week, and each two hours at a time, and besides this she had painted some screens and card-racks, and, unknown to Tom, was there ever anything so delightful, had walked into a certain shop which deals in such articles, after often peeping through the window, and had taken courage to ask the mistress of that shop whether she would buy them, and the mistress had not only bought them, but had ordered more, and that very morning Ruth had made confession of these facts to Tom, and had handed him the money in a little purse she had worked expressly for the purpose. They had been in a flutter about this, and perhaps had shed a happy tear or two for anything the history knows to the contrary. But it was all over now, and a brighter face than Tom's, or a brighter face than Ruth's, the bright sun had not looked on since he went to bed last night. "'My dear girl,' said Tom, coming so abruptly on the subject that he interrupted himself in the act of cutting a slice of bread, and left the knife sticking in the loaf, "'what a queer fellow our landlord is! I don't believe he has been home once since he got me into that unsatisfactory scrape. I begin to think he will never come home again. What a mysterious life that man does lead, to be sure! Very strange, is it not, Tom?' "'Really,' said Tom, "'I hope it is only strange.' I hope there may be nothing wrong in it. Sometimes I begin to be doubtful of that. I must have an explanation with him, said Tom, shaking his head as if this were a most tremendous threat, when I can catch him. A short double knock at the door put Tom's menacing looks to flight, and awakened an expression of surprise instead. Heyday, said Tom, an early hour for visitors. "'It must be John, I suppose. "'I—I I don't think it was his knock, Tom,' observed his little sister. "'No,' said Tom. "'It surely can't be my employer suddenly arrived in town, "'directed here by Mr. Phipps, and come for the key of the office. "'It's somebody inquiring for me. "'I declare, come in, if you please.' "'But when the person came in, Tom Pinch, instead of saying, "'Did you wish to speak to me, sir?' or, "'My name is Pinch, sir. What is your business, may I ask?' or addressing him in any such distant terms, cried out, "'Good gracious heaven!' and seized him by both hands with the liveliest manifestations of astonishment and pleasure. The visitor was not less moved than Tom himself and they shook hands a great many times, without another word being spoken on either side. Tom was the first to find his voice. 
Mark Tapley, too, said Tom, running towards the door and shaking hands with somebody else. My dear Mark, come in. How are you, Mark? He don't look a day older than he used to do at the Dragon. How are you, Mark? Uncommon jolly, sir, thank ye, returned Mr. Tapley, all smiles and bows. I hope I see you well, sir. Good gracious me, cried Tom, patting him tenderly on the back. How delightful it is to hear his old voice again. My dear Martin, sit down. My sister, Martin, Mr. Chuzzlewit, my love, Mark Tapley from the Dragon, my dear. Good gracious me, what a surprise this is. Sit down. Lord bless me. Tom was in such a state of excitement that he couldn't keep himself still for a moment, but was constantly running between Mark and Martin, shaking hands with them alternately, and presenting them over and over again to his sister. "'I remember the day we parted, Martin, as well as if it were yesterday,' said Tom. "'What a day it was, and what a passion you were in. And don't you remember my overtaking you in the road that morning, Mark, when I was going to Salisbury in the gig to fetch him, and you were looking out for a situation, and don't you recollect the dinner we had at Salisbury, Martin, with John Westlock, eh? Good gracious me, Ruth, my dear Mr. Chuzzlewit, Mark Tapley, my love from the dragon, more cups and saucers, if you please. Bless my soul, how glad I am to see you both! And then Tom, as John Westlock had done on his arrival, ran off to the loaf to cut some bread and butter for them, and before he had spread a single slice, remembered something else, and came running back again to tell it, and then he shook hands with them again, and then he introduced his sister again, and then he did everything he had done already all over again, and nothing Tom could do, and nothing Tom could say, was half sufficient to express his joy at their safe return. Mr. Tapley was the first to resume his composure. In a very short space of time he was discovered to have somehow installed himself in an office as waiter or attendant upon the party. A fact which was first suggested to them by his temporary absence in the kitchen and speedy return with a kettle of boiling water from which he replenished the teapot with a self-possession that was quite his own. "'Sit down and take your breakfast, Mark,' said Tom. "'Make him sit down and take his breakfast, Martin.' "'Oh, I gave him up long ago as incorrigible,' Martin replied. "'He takes his own way, Tom. You would excuse him, Miss Pinch, if you knew his value.' "'She knows it, bless you,' said Tom. "'I have told her all about Mark Tapley, have I not, Ruth?' "'Yes, Tom.' "'Not all,' returned Martin, in a low voice. "'The best of Mark Tapley is only known to one man, Tom. "'And but for Mark, he would hardly be alive to tell it.' "'Mark,' said Tom Pinch energetically, "'if you don't set down this minute I'll swear at you.' "'Well, sir,' returned Mr. Tapley, "'sooner than you should do that, I'll comply. "'It's a considerable invasion of a man's jollity "'to be made so particular welcome, "'but a worm is a word as signifies to be, to do, or to suffer, "'which is all the grammar and enough to as ever I was taught.' And if there's a worm alive, I'm it, for I'm always a being, sometimes a doin', and continually a sufferin'. Not jolly yet, asked Tom, with a smile. Why, well, I was rather so over the water, sir, returned Mr. Tapley, and not entirely without credit. But human nature is in a conspiracy again me, and I can't get on. I shall have to leave it in my will, sir, to be wrote upon my tomb. He was a man as might have come out strong if he could have got a chance, but it was denied him. Mr. Tapley took this occasion of looking about him with a grin, and subsequently attacking the breakfast with an appetite not at all expressive of blighted hopes or insurmountable despondency. In the meanwhile, Martin drew his chair a little nearer to Tom and his sister, and related to them what had passed at Mr. Pecksniff's house, adding in few words a general summary of the distresses and disappointments he had undergone since he left England. "'For your faithful stewardship and the trust I left with you, Tom,' he said, "'and for all your goodness and disinterestedness, I can never thank you enough. Would I add Mary's thanks to mine?' 
Ah, Tom! The blood retreated from his cheeks, and came rushing back so violently that it was pain to feel it, ease though, ease, compared with the aching of his wounded heart. When I add Mary's thanks to mine, said Barton, I have only made the poor acknowledgment it is in our power to offer, but if you knew how much we feel, Tom, you would set some store by it, I am sure. And if they had known how much Tom felt, but that no human creature ever knew, they would have set some store by him. Indeed they would. Tom changed the topic of discourse. He was sorry he could not pursue it, as it gave Martin pleasure, but he was unable at that moment. No drop of envy or bitterness was in his soul, but he could not master the firm utterance of her name. He inquired what Martin's projects were. "'No longer to make your fortune, Tom,' said Martin, "'but to try to live. I tried that once in London, Tom, and failed. If you will give me the benefit of your advice and friendly counsel, I may succeed better under your guidance. I will do anything, Tom, anything, to gain a livelihood by my own exertions. My hopes do not soar above that now. High-hearted, noble Tom! Sorry to find the pride of his old companion humbled, and to hear him speaking in this altered strain at once, he drove from his breast the inability to contend with its deep emotions, and spoke out bravely. "'Your hopes do not soar above that?' cried Tom. "'Yes, they do. How can you talk so? They soar up to the time when you will be happy with her, Martin. They soar up to the time when you will be able to claim her, Martin. They soar up to the time when you will not be able to believe that you were ever cast down in spirit or poor in pocket, Martin. Advice and friendly counsel. Why, of course, but you shall have better advice and counsel, though you cannot have more friendly than mine. You shall consult John Westlock, will go there immediately. It is yet so early that I shall have time to take you to his chambers before I go to business. They are in my way, and I can leave you there to talk over your affairs with him. So come along, come along. I am a man of occupation now, you know, said Tom, with his pleasantest smile, and have no time to lose. Your hopes don't soar higher than that? I dare say they don't. I know you pretty well. They'll be soaring out of sight soon, Martin, and leaving all the rest of us leagues behind. Aye, but I may be a little changed, said Martin, since you knew me pretty well, Tom. What nonsense! exclaimed Tom. Why should you be changed? You talk as if you were an old man. I never heard such a fellow. Come to John Westlock's. Come. Come along, Mark Tapley. It's Mark's doing, I have no doubt, and it serves you right for having such a grumbler for your companion. There's no credit to be got through being jolly with you, Mr. Pinch, anyways, said Mark, with his face all wrinkled up with grins. A parish doctor might be jolly with you. There's nothing short of going to the United States for a second trip as would make it all creditable to be jolly after seeing you again. Tom laughed, and, taking leave of his sister, hurried Mark and Martin out into the street and away to John Westlock's by the nearest road, for his hour of business was very near at hand, and he prided himself on always being exact to his time. John Westlock was at home, but, strange to say, was rather embarrassed to see them, and when Tom was about to go into the room where he was breakfasting, said he had a stranger there. It appeared to be a mysterious stranger, for John shut the door as he said it, and led them into the next room. He was very much delighted, though, to see Mark Tapley, and received Martin with his own frank courtesy, but Martin felt that he did not inspire John Westlock with any unusual interest, and twice or thrice observed that he looked at Tom Pinch doubtfully, not to say compassionately, he thought, and blushed to think, that he knew the cause of this. "'I apprehend you are engaged,' said Barton, when Tom had announced the purport of their visit. "'If you will allow me to come again at your own time, I shall be glad to do so.' "'I am engaged,' replied John, with some reluctance. "'But the matter on which I am engaged is one, to say the truth, more immediately demanding your knowledge than mine.' "'Indeed,' cried Martin. 
"'It relates to a member of your family, and is of a serious nature. "'If you will have the kindness to remain here, "'it will be a satisfaction to me to have it privately communicated to you, "'in order that you may judge of its importance for yourself.' "'And in the meantime,' said Tom, "'I must really take myself off without any further ceremony.' "'Is your business so very particular?' asked Martin. "'That you cannot remain with us for half an hour. I wish you could. What is your business, Tom?' It was Tom's turn to be embarrassed now, but he plainly said, after a little hesitation, "'Why, I am not in liberty to say what it is, Martin, though I hope soon to be in a condition to do so, and am aware of no other reason to prevent my doing so now than the request of my employer. It's an awkward position to be placed in, said Tom, with an uneasy sense of seeming to doubt his friend, as I feel every day. But I really cannot help it, can I, John? John Westlock replied in the negative, and Martin, expressing himself perfectly satisfied, begged them not to say another word, though he could not help wondering very much what curious office Tom held, and why he was so secret and embarrassed and unlike himself in reference to it. Nor could he help reverting to it in his own mind several times after Tom went away, which he did as soon as this conversation was ended, taking Mr. Tapley with him, who, as he laughingly said, might accompany him as far as Fleet Street without injury. "'And what do you mean to do, Mark?' asked Tom, as they walked on together. "'Mean to do, sir,' returned Mr. Tapley. "'I, what course of life do you mean to pursue?' "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Tapley, "'the fact is that I've been thinking rather of the matrimonial line, sir.' "'You don't say so, Mark,' cried Tom. "'Yes, sir, I've been a-turnin' of it over.' "'And who is the lady, Mark?' "'The witch, sir,' said Mr. Tapley. "'The lady, come, you know what I said,' replied Tom, laughing, "'as well as I do.' Mr. Tapley suppressed his own inclination to laugh, and with one of his most whimsically twisted looks replied, "'You couldn't guess, I suppose, Mr. Pinch?' "'How is it possible?' said Tom. "'I don't know any of your flames, Mark, except Mrs. Lupin, indeed.' "'Well, sir,' retorted Mr. Tapley, "'and supposing it was her?' Tom, stopping in the street to look at him, Mr. Tapley, for a moment, presented to his view an utterly solid and expressionless face, a perfect dead wall of countenance, but opening window after window in it with astonishing rapidity, and lighting them all up as for a general illumination, he repeated, "'Supposed, for the sake of argument, as it was her, sir?' "'Why, I thought such a connection wouldn't suit you, Mark, on any terms,' cried Tom. "'Well, sir, I used to think so myself once,' said Mark. "'But I ain't so clear about it now. A dear sweet creature, sir.' "'A dear sweet creature, to be sure she is,' cried Tom. "'But she always was a dear sweet creature, was she not?' "'Was she not?' assented Mr. Tapley. "'Then why on earth didn't you marry her at first, Tom, instead of wandering about, and losing all this time, and leaving her alone by herself, liable to be courted by other people?' "'Why, sir,' retorted Mr. Tapley, in a spirit of unbounded confidence, "'I'll tell you how it came about. You know me, Mr. Pinch, sir. There ain't a gentleman alive as knows me better. You're acquainted with my constitution?' and you're acquainted with my weakness. My constitution is to be jolly, and my weakness is to wish to find a credit in it. Very good, sir. In this state of mind, I gets a notion in my head that she looks on me with an eye of— with what you may call a favourable sort of eye, in fact, said Mr. Tapley, with modest hesitation. No doubt, replied Tom, we know that perfectly well when we spoke on this subject long ago before you left the dragon mr tapley nodded assent well sir but being at that time full of hopeful visions i arise at the conclusion that no credit is to be got out of such a way of life as that where everything agreeable would be ready to one's hand 
Look at on the bright side of human life, in short. One of my hopeful visions is that there's a deal of misery awaitin' for me in the midst of which I may come out tolerable strong, and be jolly under circumstances as reflect some credit. I goes into the world, sir, wery buoyant, and I tries this. I goes aboard ship first, and wery soon discovers, by the ease with which I'm jolly, mind you, as there's no credit to be got there. I might have took warning by this, and gave it up, but I didn't. I gets to the United States, and then I do begin, I won't deny it, to feel some little credit in sustaining my spirits. What follows, just as I'm a-beginning to come out, and have a-treadin on the words, my master deceives me. "'Deceives you?' cried Tom. "'Swindles me,' retorted Mr. Tapley, with a beaming face. "'Turns his back on everything that's made his service a creditable one, and leaves me high and dry, without a leg to stand upon, in which state I returns home. Very good. That all my hopeful visions being crushed, and finding that there ain't no credit for me nowhere, I abandons myself to despair, and says, Let me do that as has the least credit in it of all. Marry a dear sweet creature as is very fond of me, me being at the same time very fond of her, lead a happy life, and struggle no more against the blight which settles on my prospects. If your philosophy, Mark, said Tom, who laughed heartily at this speech, be the oddest I ever heard of, it is not the least wise. Mrs. Lupin has said yes, of course. Oh, I know, sir, replied Mr. Tapley. She hasn't gone so far as that yet, which I attribute principally to my not having asked her. But we was very agreeable together, comfortable, I may say, the night I come home. It's all right, sir. Well, said Tom, stopping at the temple gate, I wish you joy, Mark, with all my heart. I shall see you again to-day, I dare say. Good-bye for the present. Good-bye, sir. Good-bye, Mr. Pinch, he added, by way of soliloquy, as he stood looking after him. Although you are a damper to a honourable ambition, you little think it, but you was the first to dash my hopes. Pecksniff would have built me up for life, but your sweet temper pulled me down. Good-bye, Mr. Pinch. While these confidences were interchanged between Tom Pinch and Mark, Martin and John Westlock were very differently engaged. They were no sooner left alone together than Martin said, with an effort he could not disguise, "'Mr. Westlock, we've only met once before, but you have known Tom a long while, and that seems to render you familiar to me. I cannot talk freely with you on any subject unless I relieve my mind of what oppresses it just now. I see with pain that you so far mistrust me that you think me likely to impose on Tom's regardlessness of himself, or on his kind nature, or some of his good qualities. "'I had no intention,' replied John, "'of conveying any such impression to you, and am exceedingly sorry to have done so.' "'But you entertain it,' said Martin. "'You ask me so pointedly and directly,' returned the other, "'that I cannot deny the having accustomed myself to regard you as one who, "'not in wantonness, but in mere thoughtlessness of character, "'did not sufficiently consider his nature and did not quite treat it as it deserves to be treated. "'It is much easier to slight than to appreciate Tom Pinch.' "'This was not said warmly, but was energetically spoken too, "'for there was no subject in the world but one on which the speaker felt so strongly.' I grew into the knowledge of Tom, he pursued, as I grew towards manhood, and I have learned to love him as something infinitely better than myself. I did not think that you understood him when we met before. I did not think that you greatly cared to understand him. The instances of this which I observed in you were, like my opportunities for observation, very trivial, and were very harmless, I dare say, but they were not agreeable to me and they forced themselves upon me, for I was not upon the watch for them, believe me. You will say, added John, with a smile, as he subsided into more of his accustomed manner, that I am not by any means agreeable to you. I can only assure you, in reply, that I would not have originated this topic on any account. I originated it, said Martin, and so far from having any complaint to make against you, highly esteem the friendship you entertained for Tom, and the very many proofs you have given him of it. 
why should I endeavour to conceal from you, he coloured deeply, though, that I neither understood him nor cared to understand him when I was his companion, and that I am very truly sorry for it now. It was so sincerely said, at once so modestly and manfully, that John offered him his hand as if he had not done so before, and Martin giving his on the same open spirit, all constraint between the young men vanished. "'Now pray,' said John, "'when I tire your patience very much in what I am going to say, recollect that it has an end to it, and that the end is the point of the story.' With this preface he related all the circumstances connected with his having presided over the illness and slow recovery of the patient at the bull, and tacked on to the skirts of that narrative Tom's own account of the business on the wharf. Martin was not a little puzzled when he came to an end, for the two stories seemed to have no connection with each other, and to leave him, as the phrase is, all abroad. "'If you will excuse me for one moment,' said John, rising, I will beg you almost immediately to come into the next room." Upon that he left Martin to himself in a state of considerable astonishment, and soon came back again to fulfil his promise. Accompanying him into the next room, Martin found there a third person, no doubt the stranger of whom his host had spoken when Tom Pinch introduced him. He was a young man with deep black hair and eyes. He was gaunt and pale, and evidently had not long recovered from a severe illness. He stood as Martin entered, but sat again at John's desire. His eyes were cast downward, and but for one glance at them both, half in humiliation and half in entreaty. He kept them so, and sat quite still and silent. "'This person's name is Lucem," said John Westlock whom I have mentioned to you as having been seized with an illness at the inn near here, and undergone so much. He has had a very hard time of it ever since he began to recover, but as you see, he is now doing well." As he did not move or speak, and John Westlock made a pause, Martin, not knowing what to say, said that he was glad to hear it. "'The short statement that I wish you to hear from his own lips, Mr. Chuzzlewit,' John pursued, looking attentively at him and not at Martin, "'he made to me for the first time yesterday, and repeated to me this morning, without the least variation of any essential particular. I have already told you that he informed me before he was removed from the inn that he had a secret to disclose to me which lay heavy on his mind but fluctuating between sickness and health and between his desire to relieve himself of it and his dread of involving himself by revealing it, he has until yesterday avoided the disclosure. I never pressed him for it, having no idea of its weight or import or of my right to do so, until within a few days past, when, understanding from him on his own voluntary avowal in a letter from the country that it related to a person whose name was Jonas Chuzzlewit, and thinking that it might throw some light on that little mystery which made Tom anxious now and then, I urged the point upon him and heard his statement, as you will now, from his own lips. It is due to him to say that in the apprehension of death he committed it to writing some time since, and folded it in a sealed paper addressed to me, which he could not resolve, however, to place of his own act in my hand. He has the paper in his breast, I believe, at this moment." The young man touched it hastily, in corroboration of the fact. "'It will be well to leave that in our charge, perhaps,' said John, but do not mind it now." As he said this, he held up his hand to bespeak Martin's attention. It was already fixed upon the man before him, who, after a short silence, said in a low, weak, hollow voice, "'What relation was Mr. Anthony Chuzzlewit, who—' "'Who died to me?' said Martin. "'He was my grandfather's brother.' "'I fear he was made away with—murdered.' "'My God!' said Martin. "'By whom?' The young man, Lucem, looked up in his face, and, casting down his eyes again, replied, "'I fear by me.' "'By you?' cried Martin. "'Not by my act, but I fear by my means. Speak out,' said Martin, and speak the truth. "'I fear this is the truth.' Martin was about to interrupt him again, but John Westlock, saying softly, "'Let him tell his story in his own way,' Lucem went on thus. I have been bred a surgeon, 
and for the last few years have served a general practitioner of the city as his assistant. While I was in his employment I became acquainted with Jonas Chuzzlewit. He is the principal in this deed. What do you mean? demanded Martin sternly. Do you know that he is the son of the old man of whom you have spoken? I do, he answered. He remained silent for some moments, when he resumed at the point where he had left off. I have reason to know it, for I have often heard him wish his old father dead, and complain of his being wearisome to him, and a drag upon him. He was in the habit of doing so at a place of meeting we had, three or four of us, at night. There was no good in the place, you may suppose, when you hear that he was the chief of the party. I wish I had died myself and never seen it. He stopped again, and again resumed as before. We met to drink and game, not for large sums, but for sums that were large to us. He generally won. Whether or no, he lent money at interest to those who lost, and in this way, though I think we all secretly hated him, he came to be the master of us. To propitiate him, we made a jest of his father. It began with his debtors. I was one, and we used to toast a quicker journey to the old man, and a swift inheritance to the young one. He paused again. One night he came there in a very bad humour. He had been greatly tried, he said, by the old man that day. He and I were alone together, and he angrily told me that the old man was in his second childhood, that he was weak, imbecile, and drivelling, as unbearable to himself as he was to other people, and that it would be a charity to put him out of the way. He swore that he had often thought of mixing something with the stuff he took for his cough, which should help him to die easily. People were sometimes smothered who were bitten by mad dogs, he said. And why not help these lingering old men out of their troubles, too? He looked full at me as he said so, and I looked full at him. But it went no farther that night. He stopped once more, and was silent for so long an interval that John Westlock said, Go on. Martin had never removed his eyes from his face but was so absorbed in horror and astonishment that he could not speak. It may have been a week after that, or it may have been less or more. The matter was in my mind all the time, but I cannot recollect the time as I should any other period. When he spoke to me again, we were alone then, too, being there before the usual hour of assembly. There was no appointment between us, but I think I went there to meet him, and I know he came there to meet me. He was there first. He was reading a newspaper when I went in and nodded to me without looking up or leaving off reading. I sat down opposite and close to him. He said immediately that he wanted me to get him some of two sorts of drugs, one that was instantaneous in its effect, of which he wanted very little, one that was slow and not suspicious in appearance, of which he wanted more. While he was speaking to me, he still read the newspaper. He said, "'Drugs,' and never used any other word." neither did I. "'This all agrees with what I have heard before,' observed John Westlock. I asked him what he wanted the drugs for. He said for no harm. To physic cats, what did it matter to me? I was going out to a distant colony. I had recently got the appointment, which, as Mr. Westlock knows, I have since lost by my sickness, and which was my only hope of salvation from ruin. And what did it matter to me?' He could get them without my aid at half a hundred places, but not so easily as he could get them of me. This was true. He might not want them at all, he said, and he had no present idea of using them, but he wished to have them by him. All this time he still read the newspaper. We talked about the price. He was to forgive me a small debt. I was quite in his power, and to pay me five pounds, and there the matter dropped, through others coming in. But next night, under exactly similar circumstances, I gave him the drugs, on his saying I was a fool to think that he should ever use them for any harm, and he gave me the money. We have never met since. I only know that the poor old father died soon afterwards, just as he would have died from this cause, and that I have undergone and suffer now intolerable misery. Nothing, he added, stretching out his hands, can paint my misery. It is well deserved, but nothing can paint it. With that he hung his head, and said no more, wasted and wretched. He was not a creature upon whom to help reproaches that were unavailing. 
"'Let him remain at hand,' said Martin, turning from him, "'but out of sight, in heaven's name. "'He will remain here,' John whispered. "'Come with me.' Softly turning the key upon him as they went out, he conducted Martin into the adjoining room in which they had been before. Martin was so amazed, so shocked and confounded by what he had heard, that it was some time before he could reduce it to any order in his mind, or could sufficiently comprehend the bearing of one part upon another to take in all the details at one view. When he at length had the whole narrative clearly before him, John Westlock went on to point out the great probability of the guilt of Jodas being known to other people who traded in it for their own benefit, and who were by such means able to exert that control over him which Tom Pinch had accidentally witnessed and unconsciously assisted. This appeared so plain that they agreed upon it without difficulty, but instead of deriving the least assistance from this source, they found that it embarrassed them the more. They knew nothing of the real parties who possessed this power. The only person before them was Tom's landlord. They had no right to question Tom's landlord, even if they could find him, which, according to Tom's account, it would not be easy to do. And granting that they did question him, and he answered, which was taking a good deal for granted, he had only to say, with reference to the adventure on the wharf, that he had been sent from such and such a place to summon Jonas back on urgent business, and there was an end of it. Besides, there was the great difficulty and responsibility of moving at all in the matter. Lucem's story might be false, in his wretched state it might be greatly heightened by a diseased brain, or admitting it to be entirely true. The old man might have died a natural death. Mr. Pecksniff had been there at the time, as Tom immediately remembered when he came back in the afternoon and shared their counsels, and there had been no secrecy about it. Martin's grandfather was of right the person to decide upon the course that should be taken, but to get at his views would be impossible, for Mr. Pecksniff's views were certain to be his, and the nature of Mr. Pecksniff's views in reference to his own son-in-law might be easily reckoned upon. Apart from these considerations, Martin could not endure the thought of seeming to grasp at this unnatural charge against his relative, and using it as a stepping-stone to his grandfather's favour but that he would seem to do so if he presented himself before the grandfather in Mr. Pecksniff's house again for the purpose of declaring it, and that Mr. Pecksniff of all men would represent his conduct in that despicable light he perfectly well knew. On the other hand, to be in possession of such a statement, and take no measures of further inquiry in reference to it, was tantamount to being a partner in the guilt it professed to disclose. In a word, they were wholly unable to discover any outlet from this maze of difficulty which did not lie through some perplexed and entangled thicket, and although Mr. Tapley was promptly taken into their confidence, and the fertile imagination of that gentleman suggested many bold expedients, which, to do him justice, he was quite ready to carry into instant operation on his own personal responsibility, still baiting the general zeal of Mr. Tapley's nature, Nothing was made particularly clearer by these offers of service. It was in this position of affairs that Tom's account of the strange behaviour of the decayed clerk on the night of the tea-party became of great moment, and finally convinced them that to arrive at a more accurate knowledge of the workings of that old man's mind and memory would be to take a most important stride in their pursuit of the truth. So having first satisfied themselves that no communication had ever taken place between Lucem and Mr. Chuffey, who would have accounted at once for any suspicions the latter might entertain, they unanimously resolved that the old clerk was the man they wanted. But like the unanimous resolution of a public meeting, which will oftentimes declare that this or that grievance is not to be borne a moment longer, which is nevertheless borne for a century or two afterwards without any modification, they only reached in this the conclusion that they were all of one mind. For it was one thing to want Mr. Chuffey, and another thing to get at him, and that to do without alarming him, or without alarming Jonas or without being discomfited by the difficulty of striking, in an instrument so out of tune and so unused, the note they sought, was an end as far from their reach as ever. The question then became, who of those about the old clerk had had most influence with him that night? Tom said his young mistress clearly, but Tom and all of them shrunk from the thought of entrapping her, 
and making her the innocent means of bringing retribution on her cruel husband. Was there nobody else? Why, yes. In a very different way, Tom said, he was influenced by Mrs. Gamp, the nurse, who had once had the control of him, as he understood, for some time. They caught at this immediately. Here was a new way out, developed in a quarter until then overlooked. John Westlock knew Mrs. Gamp. He had given her employment. He was acquainted with her place of residence, for that good lady had obligingly furnished him at parting with a pack of her professional cards for general distribution. It was decided that Mrs. Gamp should be approached with caution, but approached without delay, and that the depths of that discreet matron's knowledge of Mr. Chuffey, and means of bringing them, or one of them, into communication with him, should be carefully sounded. On this service, Martin and John Westlock determined to proceed that night, waiting on Mrs. Gamp first at her lodgings, and taking their chance of finding her in the repose of private life, or of having to seek her out elsewhere in the exercise of her professional duties. Tom returned home that he might lose no opportunity of having an interview with Nadgett, by being absent in the event of his reappearance and Mr. Tapley remained, by his own particular desire, for the time being at Furnival's Inn to look after Lucem, who might safely have been left to himself, however, for any thought he seemed to entertain of giving them the slip. Before they parted on their several errands, they caused him to read aloud, in the presence of them all, the paper which he had about him, and the declaration he had attached to it, which was to the effect that he had written it voluntarily, in the fear of death and in the torture of his mind and when he had done so they all signed it, and taking it from him of his free will, locked it in a place of safety. Martin also wrote, by John's advice, a letter to the trustees of the famous grammar school, boldly claiming the successful design as his, and charging Mr. Pecksniff with the fraud he had committed. In this proceeding also, John was hotly interested, observing with his usual irreverence that Mr. Pecksniff had been a successful rascal all his life through, and that it would be a lasting source of happiness to him, John, if he could help to do him justice in the smallest particular. A busy day. But Martin had no lodgings yet. So when these matters were disposed of, he excused himself from dining with John Westlock, who was fain to wander out alone, and look for some. He succeeded, after great trouble, in engaging two garrets for himself and Mark, situated in a court at the Strand, not far from Temple Bar. Their luggage, which was waiting for them at a coach office, he conveyed to this new place of refuge, and it was with a glow of satisfaction, which as a selfish man he never could have known and never had, that thinking how much pains and trouble he had saved Mark, and how pleased and astonished Mark would be, he afterwards walked up and down the temple eating a meat pie for his dinner. End of chapter 48「Martin Chuzzlewit, Chapter 49 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens, Chapter 49 In which Mrs. Harris, assisted by a teapot, is the cause of a division between friends. Mrs. Gamp's apartment in Kingsgate Street, High Holborn, wore, metaphorically speaking, a robe of state. It was swept and garnished for the reception of a visitor. That visitor was Betsy Prigg, Mrs. Prigg of Bartlemy's, or as some said Bartlemy's, or as some said Bartlemy's, for by all these endearing and familiar appellations had the hospital of St. Bartholomew become a household word among the sisterhood which Betsy Prigg adorned. Mrs. Gamp's apartment was not a spacious one, but to a contented mind a closet is a palace, and the first-floor front at Mr. Sweetlepipe's may have been, in the imagination of Mrs. Gamp, a stately pile. If it were not exactly that to restless intellects, it at least comprised as much accommodation as any person, not sanguine to insanity, could have looked for in a room of its dimensions. For only keep the bedstead always in your mind, and you were safe. That was the grand secret. Remembering the bedstead, 
you might even stoop to look under the little round table for anything you had dropped, without hurting yourself much against the chest of drawers, or qualifying as a patient of St. Bartholomew by falling into the fire. Visitors were much assisted in their cautious efforts to preserve an unflagging recollection of this piece of furniture by its size, which was great. It was not a turn-up bedstead, nor yet a French bedstead, nor yet a four-post bedstead, but what is poetically called a tent, the sacking whereof was low and bulgy, insomuch that Mrs. Gamp's box would not go under it, but stopped half-way, in a manner which, while it did violence to the reason, likewise endangered the legs of a stranger. The frame, too, which would have supported the canopy and hangings, if there had been any, was ornamented with divers pippins carved in timber, which, on the slightest provocation, and frequently on none at all, came tumbling down, harassing the peaceful guest with inexplicable terrors. The bed itself was decorated with a patchwork quilt of great antiquity, and at the upper end, upon the side nearest to the door hung a scanty curtain of blue check which prevented the zephyrs that were abroad in kingsgate street from visiting mrs gamp's head too roughly some rusty gowns and other articles of that lady's wardrobe depended from the post and these had so adapted themselves by long usage to her figure that more than one impatient husband coming in precipitately at about the time of twilight had been for an instant stricken dumb by the supposed discovery that mrs gamp had hanged herself one gentleman coming on the usual hasty errand had said indeed that they looked like guardian angels watching of her in her sleep but that as mrs gamp said was his first and he never repeated the sentiment though he often repeated his visit the chairs in mrs gamp's apartment were extremely large and broad-backed which was more than a sufficient reason for their being but two in number they were both elbow chairs of ancient mahogany and were chiefly valuable for the slippery nature of their seats, which had been originally horsehair, but were now covered with a shiny substance of a bluish tint, from which the visitor began to slide away with a dismayed countenance immediately after sitting down. What Mrs. Gamp wanted in chairs she made up in bandboxes, of which she had a great collection devoted to the reception of various miscellaneous valuables, which were not, however, as well protected as the good woman, by a pleasant fiction, seemed to think, for, though every bandbox had a carefully closed lid, not one among them had a bottom, owing to which cause the property within was merely, as it were, extinguished. The chest of drawers, having been originally made to stand upon the top of another chest, had a dwarfish elfin look alone, but in regard of its security it had a great advantage over the bandboxes, for as all the handles had been long ago pulled off, it was very difficult to get at its contents. This, indeed, was only to be done by one or two devices, either by tilting the whole structure forward until all the drawers fell out together, or by opening them singly with knives like oysters. Mrs. Gamp stored all her household matters in a little cupboard by the fireplace, beginning below the surface, as in nature, with the coals, and mounting gradually upwards to the spirits, which, from motives of delicacy, she kept in a teapot. The chimney-piece was ornamented with a small almanac, marked here and there in Mrs. Gamp's own hand, with a memorandum of the date at which some lady was expected to fall due it was also embellished with three profiles one in colours of mrs gamp herself in early life one in bronze of a lady in feathers supposed to be mrs harris as she appeared when dressed for a ball and one in black of mr gamp deceased the last was a full length in order that the likeness might be rendered more obvious and forcible by the introduction of the wooden leg a pair of bellows a pair of pattens a toasting-fork, a kettle, a pap-boat, a spoon for the administration of medicine to the refractory, and lastly Mrs. Gamp's umbrella, which, as something of great price and rarity, was displayed with particular ostentation, completed the decorations of the chimney-piece and adjacent wall. 
Towards these objects Mrs. Gamp raised her eyes in satisfaction when she had arranged the tea-board, and had concluded her arrangements for the reception of Betsy Prig, even unto the setting forth of two pounds of Newcastle salmon intensely pickled. "'There, now drat you, Betsy, don't be long,' said Mrs. Gamp, apostrophizing her absent friend, "'for I can't abear to wait, I do assure you. To whatever place I goes, I sticks to this one mortar. I'm easy pleased. It is but little as I wants, but I must have that little of the best, and to the minute when the clock strikes, else we do not part as I could wish, but barren malice in our arts.' Her own preparations were of the best, for they comprehended a delicate new loaf, a plate of fresh butter, a basin of fine white sugar, and other arrangements on the same scale. Even the snuff with which she now refreshed herself was so choice in quality that she took a second pinch. "'There's the little bell a-ringing now,' said Mrs. Gamp, hurrying to the stairhead and looking over. "'Betsy Prig, my... "'Why, it's that there disappointin' sweetle pipes, I do believe.' "'Yes, it's me,' said the barber, in a faint voice. "'I've just come in.' "'You're always a-comin' in, I think,' muttered Mrs. Gamp to herself, "'except when you're a-goin' out. I hate no patience with that man.' "'Mrs. Gamp,' said the barber, "'I say, Mrs. Gamp.' "'Well,' cried Mrs. Gamp impatiently as she descended the stairs, "'what is it? Is the Thames a fire and cookin' its own fish, Mr. Sweetlepipes? Why, what's the man gone and been doin' of to himself? He's as white as chalk.' She added the latter clause of inquiry when she got downstairs, and found him seated in the shaving-chair, pale and disconsolate. "'You recollect—' "'You recollect young—' uh, "'Not young Wilkins,' cried Mrs. Gamp. "'Don't say young Wilkins, whatever you do. "'If young Wilkins' wife is took, it isn't anybody's wife,' exclaimed the little barber. "'Bailey, young Bailey.' "'Why, what do you mean to say that chit's been a-doin' of?' retorted Mrs. Gamp sharply. "'Stuff and nonsense, Mrs. Sweetlepipes.' "'He hasn't been a-doin' anything!' exclaimed poor Paul, quite desperate. "'What do you catch me up so short for when you see me put out to that extent that I can hardly speak? He'll never do anything again. He's done for. He's killed. The first time I ever see that boy,' said Paul, "'I charged him too much for a red pole. I asked him three halfpenny for a penny one, because I was afraid he'd beat me down. But he didn't, and now he's dead.' "'If he was to crowd all the steam engines and electric fluids that ever was into this shop and set em every one to work their hardest, they couldn't square the account, though it's only a halfpenny.' Mr. Sweetlepipe turned aside to the towel and wiped his eyes with it. "'And what a clever boy he was,' he said. "'What a surprising young chap he was, how he talked, and what a deal he knowed. Shaved in this very chair he was.' only for fun. It was all his fun. He was full of it. Ah, to think that he'll never be shaved in earnest. The birds might every one have died and welcome, cried the little barber, looking round him at the cages and again applying to the towel, sooner than I'd have heard this news. How did you ever come to hear it? said Mrs. Gamp. Who told you? "'I went out,' returned the little barber, "'into the city to meet a sporting gent upon the stock exchange "'that wanted a few slow pigeons to practice at, "'and when I'd done with them I went to get a little drop of beer, "'and there I heard everybody a-talkin' about it. "'It's in the papers.' "'You are in a nice state of confusion, Mr. Sweetlepipes, you are,' said Mrs. Gamp, shaking her head. "'And my opinion is, as half a dozen fresh young lively leeches on your temples wouldn't be too much to clear your mind, which so I tell you. What they were a-talkin' on, and what was in the papers?' "'All about it!' cried the barber. "'What else do you suppose?' Him and his master were upset on a journey, and he was carried to Salisbury, and was breathing his last when the account came away. He never spoke afterwards, not a single word. That's the worst of it to me, but that ain't all. His master can't be found. 
The other manager of that office of the city, Crimple, David Crimple, has gone off with the money and is advertised for with a reward upon the walls. Mr. Montague, poor young Bailey's master, what a boy he was, is advertised for too. Some say he slipped off to join his friend abroad, and some say he mayn't have got away yet, and they're looking for him high and low. Their office is a smash, a swindle altogether, but what's a life assurance office to a life, and what a life young Bailey's was? He was born into a whale, said Mrs. Gamp, with philosophical coolness, and he lived in a whale, and he must take the consequence of such a situation. "'But don't you hear nothing of Mr. Chuzzlewit and all this?' "'No,' said Paul. "'Nothing to speak of. His name wasn't printed as one of the board, though some people say it was just going to be. Some believe he was took in, and some believe he was one of the takers in. But however they may be, they can't prove nothing against him. This morning he went up of his own accord afore the Lord Mayor and some of our city bigwigs, and complained that he'd been swindled, and that those two persons had gone off and cheated him, and that he'd just found out that Montague's name wasn't even Montague, but something else.' and they do say that he looked like death owing to his losses but lord forgive me cried the barber coming back again to the subject of his individual grief what's his looks to me he might have died and welcome fifty times and not been such a loss as bailey at this juncture the little bell rang and the deep voice of mrs prig struck into the conversation "'Oh, you're a-talkin' about it, are you?' observed that lady. "'Well, I hope you've got it over, for I ain't interested in it myself.' "'My precious Betsy,' said Mrs. Gamp, "'how late you are!' The worthy Mrs. Prigg replied with some asperity that if perwerse people went off dead when they was least expected it weren't no fault of hern, and further— that it was quite aggravation enough to be made late when one was droppin' for one's tea without hearin' on it again. Mrs. Gamp, deriving from this exhibition of repartee some clue to the state of Mrs. Prigg's feelings, instantly conducted her upstairs, deeming that the sight of pickled salmon might work a softening change. But Betsy Prigg expected pickled salmon. It was obvious that she did, for her first words, after glancing at the table, were, "'I knowed she wouldn't have a cowcumber. Mrs. Gamp changed colour and sat down upon the bedstead. "'Lord bless you, Betsy Prigg, your words is true. I quite forgot it.' Mrs. Prigg, looking steadfastly at her friend, put her hand in her pocket, and with an air of surly triumph drew forth either the oldest of lettuces or youngest of cabbages, but at any rate a green vegetable of an expansive nature, and of such magnificent proportions that she was obliged to shut it up like an umbrella before she could pull it out. She also produced a handful of mustard and cress, a trifle of the herb called dandelion, three bunches of radishes, an onion rather larger than an average turnip, three substantial slices of beetroot, and a short prong or antler of celery, the whole of this garden stuff having been publicly exhibited but a short time before as a tuppenny salad, and purchased by Mrs. Prigg on condition that the vendor could get it all into her pocket, which had been happily accomplished in High Holborn to the breathless interest of a hackney coach stand. And she laid so little stress upon this surprising forethought that she did not even smile, but returning her pocket into its accustomed sphere, merely recommended that these productions of nature should be sliced up for the immediate consumption in plenty of vinegar. "'And don't go a droppin' none of your snuff in it,' asked Mrs. Prigg. "'In gruel, barley water, apple tea, mutton broth, and that, it don't signify. It stimulates a patient.' "'But I don't relish it myself.' "'Why, Betsy Prigg,' cried Mrs. Gamp, "'how can you talk so?' "'Why, ain't your patience, whatever their diseases is, "'always a sneeze the weary heads off along o' your snuff?' said Mrs. Prigg. "'And what if they are?' said Mrs. Gamp. "'Nothing if they are,' said Mrs. Prigg. "'But don't deny it, Sarah. "'Who denies of it?' Mrs. Gamp inquired. Mrs. Prigg returned no answer. 
"'Who denied us of it, Betsy?' Mrs. Gamp inquired again. Then Mrs. Gamp, by reversing the question, imparted a deeper and more awful character of solemnity to the same. "'Betsy, who denied us of it?' It was the nearest possible approach to a very decided difference of opinion between these ladies, but Mrs. Prigg's impatience for the meal being greater at the moment than her impatience of contradiction, she replied for the present, "'Nobody, if you don't, Sarah,' and prepared herself for tea, for a quarrel can be taken up at any time, but a limited quantity of salmon cannot. Her toilet was simple. She had merely to chuck her bonnet and shawl upon the bed, give her hair two pulls, one upon the right side and one upon the left, as if she were ringing a couple of bells, and all was done. The tea was already made. Mrs. Gamp was not long over the salad, and they were soon at the height of their repast. The temper of both parties was improved for the time being by the enjoyments of the table. When the meal came to a termination, which it was pretty long in doing, and Mrs. Gamp, having cleared away, produced the teapot from the top shelf simultaneously with a couple of wine-glasses. They were quite amiable. "'Betsy,' said Mrs. Gamp, filling her own glass and passing the teapot, "'I will now propose a toast. My frequent partner, Betsy Prigg, which, altering the name to Sarry Gamp, I drink,' said Mrs. Prigg, "'with love and tenderness.' From this moment symptoms of inflammation began to lurk in the nose of each lady, and perhaps notwithstanding all appearances to the contrary, in the temper also. "'Now, Sarah,' said Mrs. Prigg, "'joining business with pleasure, what is this case in which you want me?' Mrs. Gamp, betraying in her face some intention of returning an evasive answer, Betsy added, "'Is it, Mrs. Harris?' "'No, Betsy Prigg, it ain't,' was Mrs. Gamp's reply. "'Well,' said Mrs. Prigg, with a short laugh, "'I'm glad of that, at any rate.' "'Why should you be glad of that, Betsy?' Mrs. Gamp retorted warmly. "'She is unbeknown to you except by hearsay. Why should you be glad? If you have anything to say contrary to the character of Mrs. Harris, which I well knows behind her back, afore her face already wears, is not to be impeached.' "'Out with it, Betsy. I have known that sweetest and best of women,' said Mrs. Gamp, shaking her head and shedding tears, "'ever since afore her first, which Mr. Harris, who was dreadful timid, went and stopped his ears in an empty dog kennel, and never took his hands away or come out once till he was showed the baby, when being took with fits the doctor called him and laid him on his back upon the airy stones, and she was told to ease her mind his owls was organs.' and i have known her betsy prigg when he has hurt her feeling out by saying of his ninth that it was one too many if not two while the dear innocent was cooing in his face which thrive it did though bandy but i have never known as you had occasion to be glad betsy on accounts of mrs harris not requiring you require she never will depend upon it for her constant words and sicknesses and will be send for sarry during this touching address mrs prigg adroitly feigning to be the victim of that absence of mind which has its origin in excessive attention to one topic helped herself from the teapot without appearing to observe it mrs gamp observed it however and came to a premature close in consequence "'Well, it ain't her, it seems,' said Mrs. Prigg, coldly. "'Who is it, then?' "'You have heard me mention, Betsy,' Mrs. Gap replied, after glancing in an expressive and marked manner at the teapot, "'a person as I took care on at the time as you and me was partners off and on in that there fever at the bull.' "'Old Snuffy,' Mrs. Prigg observed. Sarah Gamp looked at her with an eye of fire, for she saw in this mistake of Mrs. Prigg another willful and malignant stab at that same weakness or custom of hers, an ungenerous allusion to which, on the part of Betsy, had first disturbed their harmony that evening. And she saw it still more clearly, when, politely but firmly correcting that lady by the distinct enunciation of the word chuffy, Mrs. Prigg received the correction with a diabolical laugh. The best among us have their failings, and it must be conceded of Mrs. Prigg 
that if there were a blemish in the goodness of her disposition, it was a habit she had of not bestowing all its sharp and acid properties upon her patients, as a thorough, amiable woman would have done, but of keeping a considerable remainder for the service of her friends. Highly pickled salmon and lettuces chopped up in vinegar may, as viands possessing some acidity of their own, have encouraged and increased this failing in Mrs. Prigg, and every application to the teapot certainly did, for it was often remarked of her by her friends that she was the most contradictory when most elevated. It is certain that her countenance became about this time derisive and defiant, and that she sat with her arms folded and one eye shut up in a somewhat offensive, besides obtrusively intelligent manner. Mrs. Gap, observing this, felt it the more necessary that Mrs. Prigg should know her place, and be made sensible of her exact station in society, as well as her obligations to herself. She therefore assumed an air of greater patronage and importance, as she went on to answer Mrs. Prigg a little more in detail. "'Mr. Chuffey, Betsy,' said Mrs. Gap, "'is weak in his mind. Excuse me if I makes remark that he may neither be so weak as people thinks, nor people may not think he is so weak as they pretends, and what I knows I knows, and what you don't you don't, so do not ask me, Betsy. But Mr. Chuffey's friends has made proposals for his being took care on, and has said to me, Mrs. Gap, will you undertake it? We couldn't think, they says, of trusting him to nobody but you, for, Sarry, you are gold as has passed the furnage. Will you undertake it, at your own price, day and night, and by your own self? No, I says, I will not, do not reckon on it. There is, I says, but one creature in the world as I would undertake on such terms, and her name is Harris. But I says, I am acquainted with a friend whose name is Betsy Prigg, that I can recommend and will assist me. Betsy, I says, is always to be trusted under me, and will be guided as I could desire. Here Mrs. Prigg, without any abatement of her offensive manner, again counterfeited abstraction of mind, and stretched out her hand to the teapot. It was more than Mrs. Gamp could bear. She stopped the hand of Mrs. Prigg with her own, and said with great feeling, "'No, Betsy, drink fair, whatever you do.' Mrs. Prigg, thus baffled, threw herself back in her chair, and closing the same eye more emphatically and folding her arms tighter, suffered her head to roll slowly from side to side while she surveyed her friend with a contemptuous smile. Mrs. Gamp resumed. "'Mrs. Harris, Betsy, bother Mrs. Harris,' said Betsy Prigg. Mrs. Gap looked at her with amazement, incredulity, and indignation, when Mrs. Prigg, shutting her eye still closer, and folding her arms still tighter, uttered these memorable and tremendous words. "'I don't believe there's no such a person!' After the utterance of which expression she leaned forward, and snapped her fingers once, twice, thrice, each time nearer to the face of Mrs. Gap and then rose to put on her bonnet as one who felt that there was now a gulf between them which nothing could ever bridge across. The shock of this blow was so violent and sudden that Mrs. Gamp sat staring at nothing with uplifted eyes and her mouth open as if she were gasping for breath until Betsy Prigg had put on her bonnet and her shawl and was gathering the latter about her throat. Then Mrs. Gamp rose, morally and physically rose, and denounced her. "'What?' said Mrs. Gamp. "'You bad creature! Have I known Mrs. Harris five and thirty year to be told at last that there ain't no such a person livin'? Have I stood her friend in all her troubles, great and small, for it to come at last to such a end as this, which her own sweet picture hangin' up afore you all the time to shame your brazen words? But will you make believe there's no such a creature, for she wouldn't demean herself to look at you, and often has she said, when I have made mention of your name, which to my sinful sorrow I have done, what, Sarry Gamp, to page yourself to her, go along with you. "'I'm a-goin', ma'am, ain't I?' said Mrs. Prigg, stopping as she said it. "'You had better, ma'am,' said Mrs. Gamp. "'Do you know who you're talking to, ma'am?' inquired her visitor. 
"'Apparently,' said Mrs. Gamp, surveying her with scorn from head to foot, "'to Betsy Prig, apparently so, I know her, no one better. Go along with you.' "'And you was a-going to take me under you,' cried Mrs. Prig, surveying Mrs. Scamp from head to foot in her turn. "'You was, was you? Oh, how kind! Why, deuce take your imprints!' said Mrs. Prig, with a rapid change from banter to ferocity. "'What do you mean?' "'Go along with you,' said Mrs. Scamp. "'I blush for you.' "'You had better blush a little for yourself while you are about it,' said Mrs. Prig. "'You and your chuffies!' "'What the poor old creature isn't mad enough, is it, eh? Ha, ha! "'He'd very soon be mad enough if you had anything to do with him,' said Mrs. Gamp. "'And that's what I was wanted for, is it?' cried Mrs. Prig triumphantly. "'Yes, but you'll find yourself deceived. I won't go near him. "'We shall see how you get on without me. I won't have nothing to do with him.' "'You never spoke a truer word than that,' said Mrs. Gamp. "'Go along with you.' She was prevented from witnessing the actual retirement of Mrs. Prig from the room, notwithstanding the great desire she had expressed to behold it by that lady, in her angry withdrawal, coming into contact with the bedstead, and bringing down the previously mentioned pippins, three or four of which came rattling on the head of Mrs. Gamp so smartly that when she recovered from this wooden shower-bath, Mrs. Prig was gone. She had the satisfaction, however, of hearing the deep voice of Betsy, proclaiming her injuries and her determination to have nothing to do with Mr. Chuffey, down the stairs and along the passage, and even out in Kingsgate Street. Likewise of seeing in her own apartment, in the place of Mrs. Prigg, Mr. Sweedlepipe and two gentlemen. "'Why, bless my life!' exclaimed the little barber. "'What's amiss? The noise you ladies have been making, Mrs. Gamp! Why, these two gentlemen have been standing on the stairs, outside the door, nearly all the time, trying to make you hear, while you were pelting away hammer and tongs. It'll be the death of the little bullfinch in the shop that draws his own water. In his fright, he's been astrain in himself all to bits, drawing more water than he could drink in a twelve-month. He must have thought it was fire.' Mrs. Gamp had in the meanwhile sunk into her chair, from whence, turning up her overflowing eyes and clasping her hands, she delivered the following lamentation. "'Oh, Mr. Sweedlepipes, which Mr. Westlock also, if my eyes do not deceive, and a friend not having the pleasure of being benown, what I've took from Betsy Prig this blessed night no mortal creature knows. If she had abused me, be it in liquor, which I thought I smelt her when she come, but could not so believe not being used myself. Mrs. Gamp, by the way, was pretty far gone, and the fragrance of the teapot was strong in the room. I could have bore it with a thankful art. But the word she spoke of Mrs. Harris Lambs could not forgive. No, Betsy, said Mrs. Gamp, in a violent burst of feeling, nor worms forget. The little barber scratched his head and shook it, and looked at the teapot, and gradually got out of the room. John Westlock, taking a chair, sat down on one side of Mrs. Gamp. Martin, taking the foot of the bed, supported her on the other. "'You wonder what we want, I dare say,' observed John. "'I'll tell you presently, when you have recovered. It's not pressing for a few minutes or so. How do you find yourself better?' Mrs. Gamp shed more tears, shook her head, and feebly pronounced Mrs. Harris's name. "'Have a little—' John was at a loss what to call it. "'Tea,' suggested Martin. "'It ain't tea,' said Mrs. Gamp. A "'Physic of some sort, I suppose,' cried John. "'Have a little.' Mrs. Gamp was prevailed upon to take a glassful. "'On condition,' she passionately observed, "'as Betsy never has another stroke of work from me.' "'Certainly not,' said John. "'She shall never help to nurse me.' "'To think,' said Mrs. Gamp, "'as she should ever have helped to nurse that friend of yours, "'and been so near of hearing things that—' "'Ah!' John looked at Martin. "'Yes,' he said, "'that was a narrow escape, Mrs. Gamp. "'Narrow indeed,' she returned. It was only my having the night in here of him in his wanderings, and her the day that saved it. What would she have said and done if she had known what I know, that perfidious wretch? 
"'Yet, oh, good gracious me!' cried Mrs. Gamp, trampling on the floor in the absence of Mrs. Prigg, "'that I should hear from that same woman's lips what I have heard her speak of Mrs. Harris.' "'Never mind,' said John. "'You know it is not true.' "'Isn't true!' cried Mrs. Gamp. "'True! Don't I know as that dear woman is expected of me at this minute, Mr. Westlock, and is a-lookin' out of window down the street with little Tommy Harris in her arms, as calls me his own gammy, and truly calls, for bless the mottled little legs of that there precious child, like Canterbury Broad, his own dear father says, which so they are. His own, I have been been ever since i found him mr westlock with his small red worsted shoe a gurgling in his throat where he had put it in his play a chick while they was leavin of him on the floor a lookin for it through the ouse and him a chokin sweetly in the parlour oh betsy prig what wickedness you've shown this night but never shall you darken sarry's doors again you twining serpent "'You are always so kind to her, too,' said John, consolingly. "'That's the cutting part. That's when it hurts me, Mr. Westlock,' Mrs. Gamp replied, holding out her glass unconsciously while Martin filled it. "'Chosen to help you with Mr. Lucem,' said John. "'Chosen to help you with Mr. Chuffy.' "'Chose one, but chose no more,' cried Mrs. Gamp. "'No partnership with Betsy Prigg again, sir.' "'No, no,' said John. "'That would never do.' "'I don't know as it ever would have done, sir,' Mrs. Gamp replied, with a solemnity peculiar to a certain stage of intoxication. "'Now that's the marks, by which Mrs. Gamp is supposed to have meant mask, is off that creature's face. I do not think it ever would have done. There are regions in families for keeping things a secret, Mr. Westlock, and having only them about you, as you knows you can repoge in. Who could repoge in Betsy Prig after her words of Mrs. Harris, sitting in that chair afore my eyes? Quite true, said John, quite. I hope you have time to find another assistant, Mrs. Gamp. Between her indignation and the teapot, her powers of comprehending what was said to her began to fail. She looked at John with tearful eyes and murmuring the well-remembered name which Mrs. Prigg had challenged, as if it were a talisman against all earthly sorrows, seemed to wander in her mind. "'I hope,' repeated John, "'that you have time to find another assistant.' "'Which short it is, indeed!' cried Mrs. Gamp, turning up her languid eyes and clasping Mr. Westlock's wrist with matronly affection. "'Tomorrow evening, sir, I waits upon his friends. Mr. Chuzzlewit appointed it from nine to ten. "'From nine to ten, said John, with a significant glance at Martin. "'And then Mr. Chuffey retires into safe-keeping, does he?' "'He needs to be kept safe, I do assure you,' Mrs. Gamp replied with a mysterious air. "'Other people besides me has had a happy deliverance from Betsy Prigg. "'I little know that woman she'd have let it out.' "'Let him out, you mean,' said John. "'Do I?' retorted Mrs. Gamp. "'Oh!' The severely ironical character of this reply was strengthened by a very slow nod, and a still slower drawing down of the corners of Mrs. Gamp's mouth. She added with extreme stateliness of manner, after indulging in a short doze. "'But I'm a keepin' of you, gentlemen, and time is precious.' Mingling with that delusion of the teapot which inspired her with the belief that they wanted her to go somewhere immediately, a shrewd avoidance of any further reference to the topics into which she had lately strayed, Mrs. Gamp rose, and putting away the teapot in its accustomed place, and locking the cupboard with much gravity, proceeded to attire herself for a professional visit. This preparation was easily made, as it required nothing more than the stuffy black bonnet, the stuffy black shawl, the pattens, and the indispensable umbrella, without which neither a lion in nor a laying out could by any possibility be attempted. When Mrs. Gamp had invested herself with these appendages, she returned to her chair, and sitting down again, declared herself quite ready. "'It's a happiness to know as one can benefit the poor sweet creature,' she observed. "'I'm sure it isn't all as can. 
The tortoise Betsy Prig inflicts is frightful. Closing her eyes as she made this remark, in the acuteness of her commiseration for Betsy's patience, she forgot to open them again until she dropped a patent. Her nap was also broken at intervals, like the fabled slumbers of Friar Bacon, by the dropping of the other patent and of the umbrella. But when she had got rid of these encumbrances, her sleep was peaceful. The two young men looked at each other ludicrously enough, and Martin, stifling his disposition to laugh, whispered in John Westlock's ear, "'What shall we do now?' "'Stay here,' he replied. Mrs. Gamp was heard to murmur, "'Mrs. Harris, in her sleep.' "'Rely upon it,' whispered John, looking cautiously towards her, "'that you shall question this old clerk, though you go as Mrs. Harris herself. We know quite enough to carry her our own way now, at all events, thanks to this quarrel, which confirms the old saying that when rogues fall out, honest people get what they want. Let Jonas Chuzzlewit look to himself, and let her sleep as long as she likes. We shall gain our end in good time. End of chapter 49martin chuzzlewit chapter fifty this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by brad philippone martin chuzzlewit by charles dickens chapter fifty surprises tom pinch very much and shows how certain confidences pass between him and his sister it was the next evening and tom and his sister were sitting together before tea talking in their usual quiet way about a great many things but not at all about lucem's story or anything connected with it for john westlock really john for so young a man was one of the most considerate fellows in the world had particularly advised tom not to mention it to his sister just yet in case it should disquiet her and i wouldn't tom he said with a little hesitation I wouldn't have a shadow on her happy face, or an uneasy thought in her gentle heart, for all the wealth and honours of the universe. Really, John was uncommonly kind, extraordinarily kind. If he had been her father, Tom said, he could not have taken a greater interest in her. But although Tom and his sister were extremely conversational, they were less lively and less cheerful than usual. Tom had no idea that this originated with Ruth but took it for granted that he was rather dull himself. In truth he was, for the lightest cloud upon the heaven of her quiet mind cast its shadow upon Tom. And there was a cloud on little Ruth that evening, yes indeed, when Tom was looking in another direction, her bright eyes stealing on towards his face would sparkle still more brightly than their custom was, and then grow dim. When Tom was silent, looking out upon the summer weather, she would sometimes make a hasty movement, as if she were about to throw herself upon his neck, then check the impulse, and when he looked round show a laughing face, and speak to him very merrily when she had anything to give Tom, or had any excuse for coming near him, she would flutter about him, and lay her bashful hand upon his shoulder, and not be willing to withdraw it, and would show by all such means that there was something on her heart which in her great love she longed to say to him, but had not the courage to utter. So they were sitting, she with her work before her, but not working, and Tom with his book beside him, but not reading, when Martin knocked at the door. Anticipating who it was, Tom went to open it, and he and Martin came back into the room together. Tom looked surprised, for an answer to his cordial greeting, Martin had hardly spoken a word. Ruth also saw that there was something strange in the manner of their visitor, and raised his eyes inquiringly to Tom's face, as if she were seeking an explanation there. Tom shook his head, and made the same mute appeal to Martin. Martin did not sit down, but walked up to the window and stood there looking out. He turned round after a few moments to speak, but hastily averted his head again without doing so. "'What has happened, Martin?' Tom anxiously inquired. "'My dear fellow, what bad news do you bring?' "'Oh, Tom,' replied Martin, in a tone of deep reproach, "'to hear you feign that interest in anything that happens to me hurts me even more than your ungenerous dealing.' 
"'My ungenerous dealing! Martin! My—' Tom could say no more. "'How could you, Tom? How could you suffer me to thank you so fervently and sincerely for your friendship, and not tell me like a man that you had deserted me? Was it true, Tom? Was it honest? Was it worthy of what you used to be, of what I'm sure you used to be, to tempt me, when you had turned against me, into pouring out my heart? Oh, Tom!' His tone was one of such strong injury, and yet of so much grief for the loss of a friend he had trusted in, it expressed such high past love for Tom, and so much sorrow and compassion for his supposed unworthiness, that Tom for a moment put his hand before his face, and had no more power of justifying himself than if he had been a monster of deceit and falsehood. "'I protest as I must die,' said Martin, "'that I grieve over the loss of what I thought you, "'and have no anger in the recollection of my own injuries. "'It is only at such a time and after such a discovery "'that we know the full measure of our old regard for the subject of it. "'I swear, little as I showed it, little as I know I showed it, "'that when I had the least consideration for you, Tom, "'I loved you like a brother.' Tom was composed by this time, and might have been a spirit of truth and a homely dress. It very often wears a homely dress, thank God, when he replied to him. "'Martin,' he said, "'I don't know what is in your mind, or who has abused it, or by what extraordinary means. But the means are false. There is no truth whatever in the impression under which you labour. It is a delusion from first to last, and I warn you that you will deeply regret the wrong you do me. I can honestly say that I have been true to you and to myself. You will be very sorry for this. Indeed, you will be very sorry for it, Martin.' "'I am sorry,' returned Martin, shaking his head. I think I never knew what it was to be sorry in my heart until now. At least, said Tom, if I had always been what you charged me with being now, and had never had a place in your regard, but had always been despised by you, and had always deserved it, you should tell me in what you have found me to be treacherous, and on what grounds you proceed. I do not entreat you, therefore, to give me that satisfaction as a favour, Martin, but I ask it of you as a right. My own eyes are my witness, returned Martin. Am I to believe them? No, said Tom calmly, not if they accuse me. But they never have accused me. Whoever has perverted them to such a purpose has wronged me almost as cruelly, his calmness rather failed him here, as you have done. I came here, said Martin, and I appeal to your good sister to hear me. Not to her, interrupted Tom. Pray do not appeal to her. She will never believe you. He drew her arm through his own as he said it. I believe it, Tom. "'No, no!' cried Tom. "'Of course not. I said so. Why, tut, tut, tut! What a silly little thing you are!' "'I never meant,' said Martin hastily, "'to appeal to you against your brother. Do not think me so unmanly and unkind. I merely appeal to you to hear my declaration that I came here for no purpose of reproach. I have not one reproach to vent, but in deep regret.' You could not know in what bitterness of regret until you know how often I have thought of Tom, how long in almost hopeless circumstances I have looked forward to the better estimation of his friendship, and how steadfastly I have believed and trusted in him. Tut, tut, said Martin, stopping her as she was about to speak. He is mistaken. He is deceived. Why should you mind? He is sure to be set right at last. Heaven bless the day that sets me right, cried Martin, if it could ever come. Amen, said Tom, and it will. Martin paused, and then said in a still milder voice, You have chosen for yourself, Tom, and will be relieved by our parting. It is not an angry one. There is no anger on my side. There is none on mine, said Tom. It is merely what you have brought about and worked to bring about. I say again, you have chosen for yourself. You have made the choice that might have been expected in most people situated as you are, but which I did not expect in you. For that, perhaps, I should blame my own judgment more than you. There is wealth and favour worth having on one side, and there is worthless friendship of an abandoned, struggling fellow on the other. You were free to make your election, and you made it, and the choice was not difficult. 
but those who have not the courage to resist such temptations should have the courage to avow what they have yielded to them, and I do blame you for this, Tom, that you receive me with a show of warmth, encouraged me to be frank and plain-spoken, tempted me to confide in you, and profess that you were able to be mine when you have sold yourself to others. I do not believe, said Martin, with emotion, hear me say it from my heart. I cannot believe, Tom, now that I am standing face to face with you, that it would have been in your nature to do me any serious harm, even though I have not discovered by chance in whose employment you were. But I should have encumbered you. I should have led you into more double dealing. I should have hazarded your retaining the favour for which you have paid so high a price, bartering away your former self, and it is best for both of us that I have found out what you so much desired to keep secret. Be just, said Tom, who had not removed his mild gaze from Martin's face since the commencement of this last address. Be just even in your injustice, Martin. You forget you have not yet told me what your accusation is. Why should I? returned Martin, waving his hand and moving towards the door. You could not know it the better for my dwelling on it, and though it would be really none the worse, it might seem to me to be. No, Tom, bygones shall be bygones between us. I can take leave of you at this moment and in this place, in which you are so amiable and so good, as heartily, if not as cheerfully, as ever I have done since we first met. All good go with you, Tom. I... you leave me so, you can leave me so, can you? said Tom. I... you... you have chosen for yourself, Tom. I... I hope it was a rash choice, Martin faltered. I think it was. I am sure it was. Good-bye." And he was gone. Tom led his little sister to her chair, and sat down in his own. He took his book and read, or seemed to read. Presently he said aloud, turning a leaf as he spoke, "'He will be very sorry for this,' and a tear stole down his face and dropped upon the page. Ruth nestled down beside him, on her knees, and clasped her arms about his neck. No, Tom, no, no. Be comforted, dear Tom. I am quite comforted, said Tom. It will be set right. Such a cruel, bad return, cried Ruth. No, no, said Tom. He believes it. I cannot imagine why, but it will be set right. More closely yet, she nestled down about him, and wept as if her heart would break. Don't, don't, said Tom. Why do you hide your face, my dear? Then, in a burst of tears, it all broke out at last. Oh, Tom, dear Tom, I know your secret heart. I have found it out. You couldn't hide the truth from me. Why didn't you tell me? I am sure I could have made you happier if you had. You love her, Tom, so dearly. Tom made a motion with his hand, as if he would have put his sister hurriedly away, but it clasped upon hers, and all his little history was written in the action. All its pathetic eloquence was in the silent touch. "'In spite of that,' said Ruth, "'you have been so faithful and so good, dear. In spite of that you have been so true and self-denying, and have struggled with yourself. In spite of that, you have been so gentle and so kind and even-tempered that I have never seen you give a hasty look or heard you say one irritable word, in spite of all you have been so cruelly mistaken. Oh, Tom, dear Tom, will this be set right too? Will it, Tom? Will you always have this sorrow in your breast, you who deserve to be so happy? Or is there any hope? and still she hid her face from Tom, and clasped him round the neck, and wept for him, and poured out all her woman's heart and soul in the relief and pain of this disclosure. It was not very long before she and Tom were sitting side by side, and she was looking with an earnest quietness in Tom's face. Then Tom spoke to her thus, cheerily, though gravely, "'I am very glad, my dear,' that this has passed between us. Not because it assures me of your tender affection, for I was well assured of that before, but because it relieves my mind of a great weight." Tom's eyes glistened when he spoke of her affection, 
and he kissed her on the cheek. "'My dear girl,' said Tom, "'with whatever feeling I regard her,' they seemed to avoid the name by mutual consent, "'I have long ago, I am sure I may say from the very first, looked upon it as a dream, as something that might possibly have happened under very different circumstances, but which can never be. Now tell me, what would you have set right?' She gave Tom such a significant little look that he was obliged to take it for an answer whether he would or no, and to go on. "'By her own choice and free consent, my love, she is betrothed to Martin, and was long before either of them knew of my existence. You would have her betrothed to me?' "'Yes,' she said directly. "'Yes,' rejoined Tom. "'But that might be setting it wrong instead of right. "'Do you think,' said Tom, with a grave smile, "'that even if she had never seen him, "'it is very likely she would have fallen in love with me? "'Why not, dear Tom?' "'Tom shook his head and smiled again. "'You think of me, Ruth,' said Tom, "'and it is very natural that you should, "'as if I were a character in a book.' and you make it a sort of poetical justice that I should, by some impossible means or other, come at last to marry the person I love. But there is a much higher justice than poetical justice, my dear, and it does not order events upon the same principle. Accordingly, people who read about heroes in books and choose to make heroes of themselves out of books consider it very fine thing to be discontented and gloomy and misanthropical and perhaps a little blasphemous because they cannot have everything ordered for their individual accommodation would you like me to become one of that sort of people no tom but still i know she added timidly that this is a sorrow to you in your own better way tom thought of disputing the position but it would have been mere folly and he gave it up. "'My dear,' said Tom, "'I will repay your affection with the truth, and all the truth. It is a sorrow to me. I have proved it to be so sometimes, though I have always striven against it. But somebody who is precious to you may die, and you may dream that you are in heaven with a departed spirit, and you may find it a sorrow to wake to the life on earth which is no harder to be borne than when you fell asleep. It is sorrowful to me to contemplate my dream, which I always knew was a dream, even when it first presented itself. But the realities about me are not to blame. They are the same as they were. My sister, my sweet companion, who makes this place so dear, is she less devoted to me, Ruth, than she would have been, if this vision had never troubled me. My old friend John, who might so easily have treated me with coldness and neglect, is he less cordial to me? The world about me, is there less good in that? Are my words to be harsh, and my looks to be sour, and is my heart to grow cold, because there has fallen in my way a good and beautiful creature, who, but for the selfish regret that I cannot call her my own, would, like all other good and beautiful creatures, make me happier and better. No, my dear sister, no, said Tom stoutly. Remembering all my means of happiness, I hardly dare to call this lurking something a sorrow. But whatever name it may justly bear— I thank heaven that it renders me more sensible of affection and attachment, and softens me in fifty ways. Not less happy, not less happy, Ruth. She could not speak to him, but she loved him as he well deserved. Even as he deserved, she loved him. She will open Martin's eyes, said Tom, with a glow of pride and that which is indeed wrong will be set right. Nothing will persuade her, I know, that I have betrayed him. It will be set right through her, and he will be very sorry for it. 
our secret Ruth is our own, and lives and dies with us. I don't believe I ever could have told it you, said Tom, with a smile, but how glad I am to think you have found it out. They had never taken such a pleasant walk as they took that night. Tom told her all so freely and so simply, and was so desirous to return her tenderness with his fullest confidence, that they prolonged it far beyond their usual hour, and sat up late when they came home. And when they parted for the night there was such a tranquil, beautiful expression in Tom's face that she could not bear to shut it out, but going back on tiptoe to his chamber door, looked in, and stood there till he saw her, and then embracing him again withdrew and in her prayers and in her sleep good times to be remembered with such fervour tom his name was uppermost when he was left alone tom pondered very much on this discovery of hers and greatly wondered what had led her to it because thought tom i have been so very careful it was foolish and unnecessary in me as i clearly see now when i am so relieved by her knowing it but I have been so very careful to conceal it from her. Of course I knew that she was intelligent and quick, and for that reason was more upon my guard, but I was not in the least prepared for this. I am sure her discovery has been sudden too. Dear me, said Tom, it's a most singular instance of penetration. Tom could not get it out of his head. There it was, when his head was on his pillow. How she trembled when she began to tell me she knew it, thought Tom, recalling all the little incidents and circumstances, and how her face flushed. But that was natural, oh, quite natural, that needs no accounting for. Tom little thought how natural it was. Tom little knew that there was that in Ruth's own heart, but newly set there, which had helped her to the reading of his mystery. Ah, Tom! He didn't understand the whispers of the temple fountain, though he passed it every day. Who so lively and cheerful as busy Ruth next morning? Her early tap on Tom's door, and her light foot outside, would have been music to him, though she had not spoken. But she said it was the brightest morning ever seen, and so it was, and if it had been otherwise, she would have made it so to Tom. She was ready with his neat breakfast when he went downstairs, and had her bonnet ready for the early walk, and was so full of news that Tom was lost in wonder. She might have been up all night collecting it for his entertainment. There was Mr. Nadgett not come home yet, and there was bread down a penny a loaf, and there was twice as much strength in this tea as in the last, and the milkwoman's husband had come out of the hospital cured, and the curly-haired child over the way had been lost all yesterday, and she was going to make all sorts of preserves in a desperate hurry, and there happened to be a saucepan in the house which was the very saucepan for the purpose, and she knew all about the last book Tom had brought home, all through, though it was a teaser to read, and she had so much to tell him that she had finished breakfast first. Then she had her little bonnet on, and the tea and sugar locked up and the keys in her reticule and the flowers as usual in Tom's coat, and was in all respects quite ready to accompany him before Tom knew she had begun to prepare. And in short, as Tom said, with a confidence in his own assertion, which amounted to a defiance of the public in general, there was never such a little woman. She made Tom talkative. It was impossible to resist her. She put such enticing questions to him about books, and about dates of churches, and about organs, and about the temple, and about all kinds of things. Indeed, she lightened the way, and Tom's heart with it, to that degree, that the temple looked quite blank and solitary when he parted from her at the gate. "'No Mr. Phipps' friend to-day, I suppose,' thought Tom, as he ascended the stairs. "'Not yet, at any rate, for the door was closed as usual.' and Tom opened it with his key. He had got the books into perfect order now, and had mended the torn leaves, and had pasted up the broken backs and substituted neat labels for the worn-out letterings. It looked a different place. It was so orderly and neat. Tom felt some pride in contemplating the change he had wrought, though there was no one to approve or disapprove of it. He was at present occupied in making a fair copy of his draft of the catalogue, on which, as there was no hurry, he was painfully concentrating all the ingenious and laborious neatness he had ever expended on a map or plan in Mr. Pecksniff's workroom. 
It was a very marvel of a catalogue, for Tom sometimes thought he was getting his money too easily, and he had determined within himself that this document should take a little of his superfluous leisure out of him. So with pens and ruler and compasses and india-rubber and pencil and black ink and red ink, Tom worked away all the morning. He thought a good deal about Martin and their interview of yesterday, and would have been far easier in his mind if he could have resolved to confide it to his friend John, and to have taken his opinion on the subject. But besides that he knew what John's boiling indignation would be, he bethought himself that he was helping Martin now in a matter of great moment, and that to deprive the latter of his assistance at such a crisis of affairs would be to inflict a serious injury upon him. "'So I'll keep it to myself,' said Tom, with a sigh. "'I'll keep it to myself.' And to work he went again, more assiduously than ever, with the pens and the ruler and the india-rubber and the pencils and the red ink, that he might forget it. He had laboured away another hour or more, when he heard a footstep in the entry down below. "'Ah,' said Tom, looking towards the door, "'Time was not long ago, either, when that would have set me wondering and expecting, but I have left off now.' The footstep came on up the stairs. Thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, said Tom, counting. "'Now you'll stop. Nobody ever comes past the thirty-eighth stair.' The person did, certainly, but only to take breath, for up the footstep came again forty, forty-one, forty-two, and so on. The door stood open. As the tread advanced, Tom looked impatiently and eagerly towards it. When a figure came upon the landing and arriving in the doorway, stopped and gazed at him, he rose up from his chair, and half believed he saw a spirit. Old Martin Chuzzlewit. The same who he had left at Mr. Pecksniff's weak and sinking. The same no, not the same, for this old man, though old, was strong, and leaned upon his stick with a vigorous hand, while with the other he signed to Tom to make no noise. One glance at the resolute face, the watchful eye, the vigorous hand upon the staff, the triumphant purpose of the figure, and such a light broke in on Tom as blinded him. "'You have expected me,' said Martin, "'a long time.' "'I was told that my employer would arrive soon,' said Tom. "'But—' "'I know. You were ignorant who he was. It was my desire. I am glad it has been so well observed. I intended to have been with you much sooner. I thought the time had come. I thought I could know no more and no worse of him than I did on that day when I saw you last. But I was wrong. He had by this time come up to Tom, and now he grasped his hand. I have lived in his house, Pinch, and had him fawning on me days and weeks and months. You know it. I have suffered him to treat me like his tool and instrument. You know it. You have seen me there. I have undergone ten thousand times as much as I could have endured if I had been the miserable weak old man he took me for. You know it. I have seen him offer love to marry. You know it. Who better? Who better, my true heart? I have had his base soul bear before me day by day, and have not betrayed myself once. I could never have undergone such torture but for looking forward to this time. He stopped, even in the passion of his speech, if that can be called passion which was so resolute and steady, to press Tom's hand again. Then he said, in great excitement, Close the door, close the door. He will not be long after me, but may come too soon. The time now drawing on, said the old man hurriedly, his eyes and whole face brightening as he spoke will make amends for all. I wouldn't have him die or hang himself for millions of golden pieces. Close the door. Tom did so, hardly knowing yet whether he was awake or in a dream. End of chapter 50
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter 51. Sheds new and brighter light upon the very dark place, and contains the sequel of the enterprise of Mr. Jonas and his friend. The night had now come when the old clerk was to be delivered over to his keepers. In the midst of his guilty distractions, Jonas had not forgotten it. It was a part of his guilty state of mind to remember it, for on his persistence in the scheme depended one of his precautions for his own safety. A hint, a word from the old man, uttered at such a moment in attentive ears, might fire the train of suspicion and destroy him. His watchfulness of every avenue to which the discovery of his guilt might be approached, sharpened with his sense of the danger by which he was encompassed, with murder on his soul, and its innumerable alarms and terrors dragging at him night and day, he would have repeated the crime, if he had seen a path of safety stretching out beyond. It was in his punishment, it was in his guilty condition, the very deed which his fears rendered insupportable, his fears would have impelled him to commit again. But keeping the old man close, according to his design, would serve his turn. His purpose was to escape where the first alarm and wonder had subsided, and when he could make the attempt without awakening instant suspicion. In the meanwhile these women would keep him quiet, and if the talking humour came upon him would not be easily startled he knew their trade. Nor had he spoken idly when he said the old man should be gagged. He had resolved to ensure his silence, and he looked to the end, not the means. He had been rough and rude and cruel to the old man all his life, and violence was natural to his mind in connection with him. "'He shall be gagged if he speaks and pinioned if he writes,' said Jonas, looking at him, for they sat alone together. "'He is mad enough for that.' I'll go through with it. Hush! Still listening. To every sound. He had listened ever since, and it had not come yet. The exposure of the assurance office, the flight of Crimple and Bullamy with the plunder, and among the rest as he feared with his own bill, which he had not found in the pocket-book of the murdered man, and which, with Mr. Peckstiff's money, had probably been remitted in one or other of those trusty friends for safe deposit at the bankers, his immense losses, and peril of being called to account as a partner in the broken firm, all these things rose in his mind at one time and always, but he could not contemplate them. He was aware of their presence, and of the rage, discomfiture, and despair they brought along with him. But he thought, of his own controlling power and direction, he thought, of the one dread question only. When would they find the body in the wood? He tried. He had never left off trying, not to forget it was there, for that was impossible. But to forget to weary himself by drawing vivid pictures of it in his fancy, by going softly about it and about it among the leaves, approaching it nearer and nearer through a gap in the boughs, and startling the very flies that were thickly sprinkled all over it, like heaps of dried currants. His mind was fixed and fastened on the discovery, for intelligence of which he listened intently to every cry and shout, listened when any one came in or went out, watched from the window the people who passed up and down the street, mistrusted his own looks and words and the more his thoughts were set upon the discovery, the stronger was the fascination which attracted them to the thing itself lying alone in the wood. He was for ever showing and presenting it, as it were, to every creature whom he saw. "'Look here! Do you know of this? Is it found? Do you suspect me?' If he had been condemned to bear the body in his arms, and lay it down for recognition at the feet of every one he met, it could not have been more constantly with him or a cause of more monotonous and dismal occupation than it was in this state of his mind. Still he was not sorry. It was no contrition or remorse for what he had done that moved him. It was nothing but alarm for his own security. The vague consciousness he possessed of having wrecked his fortune in the murderous venture intensified his hatred and revenge, and made him set the greater store by what he had gained. The man was dead, nothing could undo that. He felt a triumph yet in the reflection. 
He had kept a jealous watch on Chuffey ever since the deed, seldom leaving him but on compulsion, and then for as short intervals as possible. They were alone together now. It was twilight, and the appointed time drew near at hand. Jonas walked up and down the room. The old man sat in his accustomed corner. The slightest circumstance was matter of disquiet to the murderer, and he was made uneasy at this time by the absence of his wife, who had left home early in the afternoon and had not returned yet. No tenderness for her was at the bottom of this, but he had a misgiving that she might have been waylaid, and tempted into saying something that would criminate him when the news came. For anything he knew, she might have knocked at the door of his room while he was away, and discovered his plot. Confound her! It was like her pale face to be wandering up and down the house. Where was she now? She went to her good friend, Mrs. Todgers, said the old man, when he asked the question with an angry oath. Aye, to be sure, always stealing away into the company of that woman. She was no friend of his. Who could tell what devil's mischief they might hatch together? Let her be fetched home directly. The old man, muttering some words softly, rose as if he would have gone himself, but Jonas thrust him back into his chair with an impatient imprecation, and sent a servant-girl to fetch her. When he had charged her with her errand, he walked to and fro again, and never stopped till she came back, which she did pretty soon, the way being short, and the woman having made good haste. Well, where was she? Had she come? No, she had left there full three hours. Left there? Alone? The messenger had not asked, taking that for granted. Curse you for a fool! Bring candles! She had scarcely left the room when the old clerk, who had been unusually observant of him ever since he had asked about his wife, came suddenly upon him. "'Give her up!' cried the old man. "'Come, give her up to me. Tell me what you have done with her. Quick, I have made no promises on that score. Tell me what you have done with her.' He laid his hands upon his collar as he spoke, and grasped it tightly, too. "'You shall not leave me!' cried the old man. "'I am strong enough to cry out to the neighbours, and I will, unless you give her up. Give her up to me!' Jonas was so dismayed and conscience-stricken that he had not even hardihood enough to unclench the old man's hands with his own but stood looking at him as well as he could in the darkness, without moving a finger. It was as much as he could do to ask what he meant. "'I will know what you have done with her,' retorted Chuffey. "'If you hurt a hair of her head, you shall answer it. Poor thing, poor thing! Where is she?' "'Why, you old madman,' said Jonas, in a low voice and with trembling lips, "'What bedlam fit has come upon you now? "'It is enough to make me mad, "'seeing what I have seen in this house,' cried Chuffey. "'Where is my dear old master? "'Where is his only son that I have nursed upon my knee, a child? "'Where is she?' She who was the last, she that I've seen pining day by day, and heard weeping in the dead of night. She was the last, the last of all my friends. Heaven help me, she was the very last. Seeing that the tears were stealing down his face, Jonas mustered courage to unclench his hands and push him off before he answered. Did you hear me ask for her? Did you hear me send for her? How can I give you up when I haven't got, idiot? Ye God, I'd give her up to you and welcome if I could, and a precious pair you'd be. If she has come to any harm, cried Chuffey, mind, I'm old and silly, but I have my memory sometimes, and if she has come to any harm— Devil take you, interrupted Jonas, but in a suppressed voice still. What harm do you suppose she has come to? I know no more where she is than you do. I wish I did. 
"'Wait till she comes home and see. She can't be long. Will that content you?' "'Mind!' exclaimed the old man. "'Not a hair of her head! Not a hair of her head ill-used! I won't bear it! I, I have borne it too long, Jonas! I am silent, but I, I, I can speak! I, I, I can speak!' he stammered, as he crept back to his chair, and turned a threatening, though a feeble, look upon him. "'You can speak, can you?' thought Jonas. "'So, so, we'll stop your speaking. "'It's well I knew of this in good time. "'Prevention is better than cure.' He had made a poor show of playing the bully and evincing a desire to conciliate at the same time, but was so afraid of the old man that great drops had started out upon his brow, and they stood there yet. His unusual tone of voice and agitated manner had sufficiently expressed his fear— but his face would have done so now, without that aid, as he again walked to and fro, glancing at him by the candlelight. He stopped at the window to think. An opposite shop was lighted up, and the tradesman and a customer were reading some printed bill together across the counter. The sight brought him back instantly to the occupation he had forgotten. "'Look here. Do you know of this? Is it found? Do you suspect me?' A hand upon the door. "'What's that?' "'A pleasant evening,' said the voice of Mrs. Gamp, "'the warm which, bless you, Mr. Chuzzlewit, "'we must expect when Calcumers is three for tuppence. "'How does Mr. Chuffy find himself to-night, sir?' Mrs. Gamp kept particularly close to the door in saying this, and curtsied more than usual. She did not appear to be quite so much at her ease as she generally was. "'Get him to his room,' said Jonas, walking up to her and speaking in her ear. "'He has been raving to-night. Stark mad. Don't talk while he's here, but come down again.' "'Poor sweet dear,' cried Mrs. Gamp, with uncommon tenderness. "'He's all of a tremble.' "'Well, he may be,' said Jonas, after the mad fit he has had. "'Get him upstairs.' She was by this time assisting him to rise. "'There's my blessed old chick!' cried Mrs. Gamp, in a tone that was at once soothing and encouraging. "'There's my darling Mr. Chuffy. Now come up to your own room, sir, and lay down on your bed a bit, for you're a shaken all over, as if your precious giants were hung upon wires. There's a good creature. Come with Sarry. "'Is she come home inquired the old man she'll be here directly minute returned mrs gamp come with sarry mr chuffey come with your own sarry the good woman had no reference to any female in the world as promising the speedy advent of the person for whom mr chuffey inquired but merely threw it out as a means of pacifying the old man it had its effect for he permitted her to lead him away and they quitted the room together Jonas looked out of the window again. They were still reading the printed paper in the shop opposite, and a third man had joined in the perusal. What could it be to interest them so? A dispute or discussion seemed to arise among them, for they all looked up from their reading together, and one of the three, who had been glancing over the shoulder of another, stepped back to explain or illustrate some action by his gestures. Horror! How like the blow he had struck in the wood! It beat him from the window as if it had lighted on himself. As he staggered into a chair he thought of the change in Mrs. Gamp exhibited in her new-born tenderness to her charge. Was that because it was found, because she knew of it, because she suspected him? "'Mr. Chuffey is a-lying down,' said Mrs. Gamp, returning, "'and much good may it do him. Mr. Chuzzlewit, which harm it can't and good it may be joyful.' "'Sit down,' said Jonas hoarsely, "'and let us get this business done. "'Where is the other woman?' "'The other person's with him now,' she answered. "'That's right,' said Jonas. "'He is not fit to be left to himself. "'Why, he fastened on me last night here, "'upon my coat, like a savage dog. "'Old as he is, and feeble as he is usually, "'I had some trouble to shake him off. "'You... hush! "'It's nothing. "'You told me the other woman's name. "'I forget it.' "'I mentioned Betsy Prigg,' said Mrs. Gamp. "'She is to be trusted, is she?' "'That she ain't,' said Mrs. Gamp. "'Nor have I brought her, Mr. Chuzzlewit. "'I've brought another, 
which engages to give every satisfaction. What is her name? asked Jonas. Mrs. Gamp looked at him in an odd way, without returning any answer, but appeared to understand the question, too. What is her name? repeated Jonas. Her name, said Mrs. Gamp, is Harris. It was extraordinary how much effort it cost Mrs. Gamp to pronounce the name she was commonly so ready with. She made some three or four gasps before she could get it out, and when she had uttered it, pressed her hand upon her side, and turned up her eyes as if she were going to faint away. But knowing her to labour under a complication of internal disorders, which rendered a few drops of spirits indispensable at certain times to her existence, and which came on very strong when that remedy was not at hand, Jonas merely supposed her to be the victim of one of these attacks. "'Well,' he said hastily, for he felt how incapable he was of confining his wandering attention to the subject, "'you and she have arranged to take care of him, have you?' Mrs. Gamp replied in the affirmative and slowly discharged herself of her familiar phrase. "'Turn and turn about, one off, one on!' But she spoke so tremulously that she felt called upon to add, "'Which fiddle strings is weakness to expedge my nerves this night?' Jonas stopped to listen, then said hurriedly, "'We shall not quarrel about terms. Let them be the same as they were before. Keep him close and keep him quiet. He must be restrained. He has got it in his head tonight that my wife's dead and has been attacking me as if I had killed her. It's it's common with bad people to take the worst fancies of those they like best, isn't it? Mrs. Scamp assented with a short groan. Keep him close, then, or in one of his fits he'll be doing me a mischief. And don't trust him at any time, for when he seems most rational he's wildest in his talk. But that you know already. Let me see the other. "'The t'other person, sir?' said Mrs. Gamp. "'Ay, go you to him and send the other. Quick, I'm busy.' Mrs. Gamp took two or three backward steps towards the door and stopped there. "'It's your wishes, Mr. Chuzzlewit,' she said, in a sort of quavering croak, "'to see the t'other person, is it?' But the ghastly change in Jonas told her that the other person was already seen. Before she could look round toward the door, she was put aside by old Martin's hand, and Chuffey and John Westlock entered with him. "'Let no one leave the house,' said Martin. "'This man is my brother's son, ill-met, ill-trained, ill-begotten. If he moves from the spot on which he stands or speaks a word above his breath to any person here, open the window and call for help.' "'What right have you to give such directions in this house?' asked Jonas faintly. "'The right of your wrong-doing. Come in there!' An irrepressible exclamation burst from the lips of Jonas as Lucem entered at the door. It was not a groan or a shriek or a word, but was wholly unlike any sound that had ever fallen on the ears of those who heard it, while at the same time it was the most sharp and terrible expression of what was working in his guilty breast that nature could have invented. He had done murder for this. He had girdled himself about with perils, agonies of mind, innumerable fears for this. He had hidden his secret in the woods, pressed and stamped it down into the bloody ground, and here it started up when least expected, miles upon miles away, known to many, proclaiming itself from the lips of an old man who had renewed his strength and vigour as by a miracle, to give it voice against him. He leaned his hand on the back of a chair and looked at them. It was in vain to try to do so scornfully, or with his usual insolence. He required the chair for his support, but he made a struggle for it. "'I know that fellow,' he said, fetching his breath at every word, and pointing his trembling finger towards Lucem. "'He's the greatest liar alive. What's his last tale? <laughs> You're rare fellows, too. Why, that uncle of mine is childish. He's even a greater child than his brother my father was in his old age, or than Chuffy is. "'What the devil do you mean?' he added, looking fiercely at John Westlock and Mark Tapley, the latter had entered with Lucem, "'by coming here and bringing two idiots and a knave with you to take my house by storm. Hello there! Open the doors! Turn these strangers out!' "'I'll tell you what,' cried Mr. Tapley, coming forward, "'if it wasn't for your name, I'd drag you through the streets of my own accord, and single-handed I would. I would. Don't try and look bold at me. You can't do it. Now go on, sir.' this was to old Martin, bring the murderin' wagabond upon his knees. If he wants noise, he shall have enough of it, 
for as sure as he's a shiverin from head to foot, I'll raise a uproar at this winter that shall bring half London in. Go on, sir. Let me try him once and see whether I'm a man of my word or not. With that, Mark folded his arms and took his seat upon the window ledge, with an air of general preparation for anything, which seemed to imply that he was equally ready to jump out himself or to throw Jonas out, upon receiving the slightest hint that it would be agreeable to the company. Old Martin turned to Lucem. "'This is the man,' he said, extending his hand towards Jonas. "'Is it?' "'You need do no more than look at him to be sure of that, or of the truth of what I have said,' was the reply. "'He is my witness.' "'Oh, brother!' cried old Martin, clasping his hands and lifting up his eyes. "'Oh, brother, brother! Were we strangers half our lives that you might breed a wretch like this, and I make life a desert by withering every flower that grew about me? Is it the natural end of your precepts and mine that this should be the creature of your rearing, training, teaching, hoarding, striving for, and I the means of bringing him to punishment when nothing can repair the wasted past. He sat down upon a chair as he spoke, and turning away his face was silent for a few moments. Then, with recovered energy, he proceeded. But the accursed harvest of our mistaken lies shall be trodden down. It is not too late for that. You are confronted with this man, you monster there, not to be spared, but to be dealt with justly. Hear what he says. Reply. Be silent. Contradict. Repeat. Defy. Do what you please. My course will be the same. Go on. And you, he said to Chuffey, for the love of your old friend, speak out, good fellow. I have been silent for his love, cried the old man. He urged me to it. He made me promise it upon his dying bed. I never would have spoken but for your finding out so much. I have thought about it ever since. I couldn't help that, and sometimes I have had it all before me in a dream. But in the daytime, not in sleep, is there such a kind of dream? said Chuffey, looking anxiously in old Martin's face. As Martin made him an encouraging reply, he listened attentively to his voice and smiled. "'Ah, I,' he cried, "'he often spoke to me like that. We were at school together, he and I. I couldn't turn against his son, you know, his only son, Mr. Chuzzlewit.' "'I would to heaven you had been his son,' said Martin. "'You speak so like my dear old master,' cried the old man with a childish delight, "'that I almost think I hear him. "'I can hear you quite as well as I used to hear him. "'It makes me young again. "'He never spoke unkindly to me, and I always understood him. "'I could always see him, too.' though my sight were dim. Well, well, he's dead, he's dead. He was very good to me, my dear old master. He shook his head mournfully over the brother's hand. At this moment Mark, who had been glancing out of the window, left the room. I couldn't turn against his only son, you know, said Chuffey. He has nearly driven me to do it sometimes. He very nearly did to-night. Ah! cried the old man, with a sudden recollection of the cause. Where is she? She's not come home. Do you mean his wife? said Mr. Chuzzlewit. Yes. I have removed her. She is in my care, and will be spared the present knowledge of what is passing here. She has known misery enough without that addition. Jonas heard this with a sinking heart. He knew that they were on his heels, and felt that they were resolute to run him to destruction. Inch by inch the ground beneath him was sliding from his feet. Faster and faster the encircling ruin contracted and contracted towards himself, its wicked centre, 
until it should close in and crush him. And now he heard the voice of his accomplice stating to his face, with every circumstance of time and place and incident, and openly proclaiming with no reserve, suppression, passion, or concealment, all the truth. The truth which nothing would keep down, which blood would not smother, and earth would not hide, the truth whose terrible inspiration seems to change dotards into strong men, and on whose avenging wings one whom he had supposed to be at the extremest corner of the earth came swooping down upon him. He tried to deny it, but his tongue would not move. He conceived some desperate thought of rushing away and tearing through the streets, but his limbs would as little answer to his will as his stark, stiff, staring face. All this time the voice went slowly on, denouncing him. It was as if every drop of blood in the wood had found a voice to jeer him with. When it ceased, another voice took up the tale. But strangely, for the old clerk who had watched, and listened to the whole, and had wrung his hands from time to time as if he knew its truth and could confirm it, broke in with these words. "'No, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, all wrong together. Have patience, for the truth is only known to me.' "'How can that be?' said his old master's brother. "'After what you have heard. Besides, you said just now above stairs, when I told you of the accusation against him, that you knew he was his father's murderer.' "'Ah, yes, and so he was,' cried Chuffey wildly. "'But not as you suppose, not as you suppose. Stay. Give me a moment's time. I have it all here. All here. It was foul, foul, cruel, bad.' but not as you suppose. Stay, stay. He put his hands up to his head, as if it throbbed or pained him. After looking about him in a wandering and vacant manner for some moments, his eyes rested upon Jonas, when they kindled up with sudden recollection and intelligence. Yes, cried old Chuffey. Yes, yes, that's how it was. It's all upon me now. He... he got up from his bed before he died, to be sure, to say that he forgave him, and he came down with me into this room, and when he saw him, his only son, the son he loved, his speech forsook him. He had no speech for what he knew, and no one understood him except me, but I did, I did. Old Martin regarded him in amazement. So did his companions. Mrs. Gamp, who had said nothing yet, but had kept two-thirds of herself behind the door ready for escape, and one-third in the room ready for siding with the strongest party, came a little further in and remarked with a sob that Mr. Chuffey was the sweetest old creature going. "'He bought the stuff,' said Chuffey, stretching out his arm towards Jonas, while an unwanted fire shone in his eye and lighted up his face. "'He bought the stuff, no doubt, as you have heard, and brought it home. He mixed the stuff, look at him, with some sweet meat in a jar, exactly as the medicine for his father's cough was mixed, and put it in a drawer.' in that drawer yonder in the desk he knows which drawer i mean he kept it there locked up but his courage failed him or his heart was touched my god i hope it was his heart he was his only son and he did not put it in the usual place where my old master would have taken it twenty times a day the trembling figure of the old man shook with the strong emotions that possessed him, but with the same light in his eye, and with his arm outstretched, and with his grey hair stirring on his head, he seemed to grow in size and was like a man inspired. Jonas shrunk from looking at him and cowered down into the chair by which he had held. It seemed as if this tremendous truth could make the dumb speak. "'I know it every word now,' cried Chuffey. "'Every word!' He put it in that drawer, as I have said. He went so often there, and was so secret, that his father took notice of it, and when he was out, had it opened. We were there together, 
and we found the mixture mr chuzzlewit and i he took it into his possession and made light of it at the time but in the night he came to my bedside weeping and told me that his own son had it in his mind to poison him oh chuff he said oh dear old chuff a voice came into my room to-night and told me that this crime began with me it began when i taught him to be too covetous of what i have to leave and made the expectation of it his great business those were his words ay they are his very words if he was a hard man now and then it was for his only son he loved his only son and he was always good to me jonas listened with increased attention hope was breaking in upon him he shall not be weary for my death chuff that was what he said next pursued the old clerk as he wiped his eyes that was what he said next crying like a little child he shall not weary for my death chuff he shall have it now he shall marry where he has a fancy chuff although it don't please me and you and i will go away and live upon a little i always loved him perhaps he'll love me then it's a dreadful thing to have my own child thirsting for my death but i might have known it i have sown and i must reap he shall believe that i am taking this and when i see that he is sorry and has all his wants i'll tell him that i found it out and i'll forgive him he'll make a better man of his own son and be a better man himself perhaps chuff poor chuffy paused to dry his eyes again old martin's face was hidden in his hands jonas listened still more keenly and his breast heaved like a swollen water but with hope with growing hope my dear old master made believe next day said chuffey that he had opened the drawer by mistake with a key from the bunch which happened to fit it we had one made and hung upon it and that he had been surprised to find his fresh supply of cough medicine in such a place but supposed it had been put there in a hurry when the drawer stood open we burnt it but his son believed that he was taking it he knows he did once mr chuzzlewit to try him took heart to say it had a strange taste and he got up directly and went out jonas gave a short dry cough and changing his position for an easier one folded his arms without looking at them though they could now see his face mr chuzzlewit wrote to her father i mean the father of the poor thing who's his wife said chuffey and got him to come up intending to hasten on the marriage but his mind like mine went a little wrong through grief and then his heart broke he sank and altered from the time when he came to me in the night and never held up his head again it was only a few days but he had never changed so much in twice the years spare him chuff he said before he died they were the only words he could speak spare him chuff i promised him i would i've tried to do it he's his only son on his recollection of the last scene in his old friend's life poor chuffey's voice which had grown weaker and weaker quite deserted him making a motion with his hand as if he would have said that anthony had taken it and had died with it in his he retreated to the corner where he usually concealed his sorrows and was silent jonas could look at his company now and vauntingly too well he said after a pause are you satisfied 
or have you any more of your plots to broach? Why, that fellow Loosem can invent him for you by the score. Is that all? Have you nothing else?' Old Martin looked at him steadily. "'Whether you are what you seem to be at Pecksniff's, or are something else at a Montebank, I don't know and I don't care,' said Jonas, looking downward with a smile. "'But I don't want you here. You were here so often when your brother was alive and were always so fond of him, your dear, dear brother, and you would have been cuffing one another before this, he cod, that I am not surprised at your being attached to the place. But the place is not attached to you, and you can't leave it too soon, though you may leave it too late. As for my wife, old man, send her home straight, or it will be the worse for her, ha <laughs> ha. You carry it with a high hand, too. But it isn't hanging yet for a man to keep a penn'orth of poison for his own purposes, and have it taken from her by two old crazy jolterheads who go out and act a play about it, ha <laughs> ha. Do you see the door? His base triumph struggling with his cowardice and shame and guilt, was so detestable that they turned away from him, as if he were some obscene and filthy animal repugnant to the sight. And here that last black crime was busy with him too, working within him to his perdition. But for that the old clerk's story might have touched him, though never so lightly, but for that the sudden removal of so great a load might have brought about some wholesome change even in him. With that deed done, however, with that unnecessary wasteful danger haunting him, despair was in his very triumph and relief, wild, ungovernable, raging despair for the uselessness of the peril into which he had plunged, despair that hardened him and maddened him, and set his teeth a-grinding in a moment of his exultation. "'My good friend,' said old Martin, laying his hand on Chuffey's sleeve, "'this is no place for you to remain in. Come with me.' "'Just his old way!' cried Chuffey, looking up into his face. "'I almost believe it's Mr. Chuzzlewit alive again. "'Yes, take me with you. Stay, though, stay.' "'For what?' asked old Martin. "'I can't leave her, poor thing,' said Chuffey. "'She has been very good to me.' I can't leave her, Mr. Chuzzlewit. Thank you kindly. I'll remain here. I haven't long to remain. It's no great matter. As he meekly shook his poor grey head and thanked old Martin in these words, Mrs. Gamp, now entirely in the room, was affected to tears. The mercy as it is, she said, as such a dear, good, reverend creature never got into the clutches of Betsy Prig which but for me he would have done, undoubted facts being stubborn and not easy drove. "'You heard me speak to you just now, old man,' said Jonas to his uncle. "'I'll have no more tampering with my people, man or woman. Do you see the door?' "'Do you see the door?' returned the voice of Mark, coming from that direction. "'Look at it.' He looked, and his gaze was nailed there. Fatal, ill omen, blighted threshold, cursed by his father's footsteps in his dying hour, cursed by his young wife's sorrowing tread, cursed by the daily shadow of the old clerk's figure, cursed by the crossing of his murderer's feet, what men were standing in the doorway? Nadget foremost. Hark! It came on, roaring like a sea. Hawkers burst into the street, crying it up and down. Windows were thrown open that the inhabitants might hear it. People stopped to listen in the road and on the pavement. The bells, the same bells, began to ring, tumbling over one another in a dance of boisterous joy at the discovery. That was the sound they had in his distempered thoughts, and making their airy playground rock. "'That is the man,' said Dadgett. "'By the window!' Three others came in, laid hands upon him, and secured him. It was so quickly done that he had not lost sight of the informer's face for an instant when his wrists were manacled together. "'Murder!' said Dadgett, looking round on the astonished group. "'Let no one interfere!' The sounding street repeated murder, barbarous and dreadful murder, 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 rolling on from house to house and echoing from stone to stone until the voices died away into the distant hum which seemed to mutter the same word. They all stood silent, listening, and gazing in each other's faces as the noise passed on. Old Martin was the first to speak. "'What terrible history is this?' he demanded. "'Ask him,' said Dadgett. 
"'You're his friend, sir. He can tell you if he will. He knows more of it than I do, though I know much. How do you know much?' "'I have not been watching him so long for nothing,' returned Nadgett. "'I never watched a man so close as I've watched him.' Another of the phantom forms of this terrific truth, another of the many shapes in which it started up about him, out of vacancy, this man, of all men in the world, a spy upon him, this man, changing his identity, casting off his shrinking, purblind, unobservant character, and springing up into a watchful enemy— the dead man might have come out of his grave and not confounded and appalled him more. The game was up. The race was at an end. The rope was woven for his neck. If by a miracle he could escape from this strait, he had but to turn his face another way, no matter where, and there would rise some new avenger front to front with him, some infant in an hour grown old, or old man in an hour grown young, or blind man with his sight restored, or deaf man with his hearing given him. There was no chance. He sank down in a heap against the wall, and never hoped again from that moment. "'I am not his friend.' "'Though I have the honour to be his relative,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit, "'you may speak to me. Where have you watched, and what have you seen?' "'I have watched in many places,' returned Nadgett, "'night and day. I have watched him lately, almost without rest or relief. His anxious face and his bloodshot eyes confirmed it. I little thought to what my watching was to lead.' as little as he did when he slipped out in the night, dressed in those clothes which he afterwards sunk in a bundle at London Bridge. Jonas moved upon the ground like a man in bodily torture. He uttered a suppressed groan, as if he had been wounded by some cruel weapon, and plucked at the iron band upon his wrists, as though, his hands being free, he would have torn himself. "'Steady, kinsman,' said the chief officer of the party. "'Don't be violent.' "'Whom do you call kinsmen?' asked old Martin sternly. "'You,' said the man, among others. Martin turned his scrutinizing gaze upon him. He was sitting lazily across a chair, with his arms resting on the back, eating nuts and throwing the shells out of window as he cracked them, which he still continued to do while speaking. "'Aye,' he said, with a sulky nod, "'you may deny your nephews till you die. But Chevy Slime is Chevy Slime still all the world over.' Perhaps even you may feel it some disgrace to your own blood to be employed in this way. I'm to be bought off. At every turn, cried Martin, self, 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 every one among them for himself. You had better save one or two among them the trouble than and be for them as well as yourself, replied his nephew. Look here at me. Can you see the man of your family who has more talent in his little finger than all the rest of their united brains, dressed as a police officer without being ashamed? I took up with this trade on purpose to shame you. I didn't think I should have to make a capture in the family, though. If your debauchery and that of your chosen friends has really brought you to this level, returned the old man, keep it. You are living honestly, I hope, and that's something. Don't be hard upon my chosen friends, returned Slime. But they were sometimes your chosen friends, too. Don't say you never employed my friend Tig, for I know better. We quarrelled upon it. I hired the fellow, retorted Mr. Chuzzlewit, and I paid him. It's well you paid him, said his nephew, for it would be too late to do so now. He has given his receipt in full, or had it forced from him, rather. The old man looked at him as if he were curious to know what he meant, but scorned to prolong the conversation. "'I have always expected that he and I would be brought together again in the course of business,' said Slime, taking a fresh handful of nuts from his pocket. "'But I thought he would be wanted for some swindling job. It never entered my head that I should hold a warrant for the apprehension of his murderer.' "'His murderer?' cried Mr. Chuzzlewit, looking from one to another. "'His or Mr. Montague's,' said Nadgett. "'They are the same, I am told.' "'I accuse him yonder of the murder of Mr. Montague, who was found last night killed in a wood. "'You will ask me why I accuse him, as you have already asked me how I know so much. "'I'll tell you. It can't remain a secret long.' "'The ruling passion of the man expressed itself even then, in the tone of regret, "'in which he deplored the approaching publicity of what he knew. "'I told you I had watched him,' he proceeded. "'I was instructed to do so by Mr. Montague, in whose employment I have been for some time.' We had our suspicions of him, and you know what they pointed at, for you have been discussing it since we were waiting here outside the room. If you care to hear, now it's all over, in what our suspicions began, I'll tell you plainly. 
had a quarrel, it first came to our ears through a hint of his own, between him and another officer in which his father's life was insured, and which had so much doubt and distrust upon the subject, that he compounded with them, and took half the money, and was glad to do it. Bit by bit, I ferreted out more circumstances against him, and not a few. It required a little patience, but it's my calling. I found the nurse. Here she is, to confirm me. I found the doctor. I found the undertaker. I found the undertaker's man. I found out how the old gentleman there, Mr. Chuffey, had behaved at the funeral. And I found out what this man, touching Lucem on the arm, had talked about in his fever. I found out how he conducted himself before his father's death, and how since, and how at that time, and writing it all down, and putting it carefully together, made case enough for Mr. Montague to tax him with the crime, which, as he himself believed until last night, he had committed. I was by when this was done. You see him now. He is only worse than he was then. Oh, miserable, miserable fool! Oh, insupportable, excruciating torture! to find alive and active, a party to it all, the brain and right hand of the secret he had thought to crush, in whom, though he had walled the murdered man up by enchantment in a rock, the story would have lived and walked abroad. He tried to stop his ears with his fettered arms that he might shut out the rest. As he crouched upon the floor, they drew away from him as if a pestilence were in his breath. They fell off one by one from that part of the room, leaving him alone upon the ground. Even those who had him in their keeping shunned him, and, with the exception of Slime, who was still occupied with his nuts, kept apart. "'From that garret window opposite,' said Nadget, pointing across the narrow street, "'I have watched this house for him for days and nights. From that garret window opposite I saw him return home alone from a journey on which he had set out with Mr. Montague. That was my token that Mr. Montague's end was gained, and I might rest easy on my watch, though I was not to leave it until he dismissed me. But standing at the door opposite after dark that same night, I saw a countryman steal out of this house by a side door in the court, who had never entered it. I knew his walk, and that it was himself disguised. I followed him immediately. I lost him on the western road, still travelling westward. Jonas looked up at him for an instant, and muttered an oath. I could not comprehend what this meant, said Nadget, but having seen so much, I resolved to see it out and through. And I did, learning on inquiring at his house from his wife that he was supposed to be sleeping in the room from which I had seen him go out, that he had given strict orders not to be disturbed. I knew that he was coming back, and for his coming back I watched. I kept my watch in the street, in doorways and such places, all that night, at the same window, all next day and when night came on again in the street once more, for I knew he would come back, as he had gone out, when this part of the town was empty. He did. Early in the morning the same countryman came creeping, creeping, creeping home. "'Look sharp,' imposed Slime, who had now finished his nuts. "'This is quite irregular, Mr. Nadget. "'I kept at the window all day,' said Nadget, without heeding him. "'I think I never closed my eyes. "'At night I saw him come out with a bundle.' I followed him again. He went down the steps at London Bridge and sunk it in the river. I now began to entertain some serious fears and made communication to the police, which caused that bundle to be— To be fished up, interrupted Slime. Be alive, Mr. Nadget. It contained the dress I had seen him wear, said Nadget, stained with clay and spotted with blood. Information of the murder was received in town last night. The wearer of that dress is already known to have been seen near the place, to have been lurking in that neighbourhood, to have alighted from a coach coming from that part of the country, at the time exactly tallying with the very minute when I saw him returning home. The warrant has been out, and these officers have been with me some hours. We chose our time, and seeing you come in, and seeing this person at the window— "'Beckon to him,' said Mark taking up the thread of the narrative on hearing this allusion to himself, to open the door, which he did with a deal of pleasure. "'That's all at present,' said Nadget, putting up his great pocket-book, which from mere habit he had produced when he began his revelation, and had kept in his hand all the time. "'But there is plenty more to come. You asked me for the facts, so far I have related them, and need not detain these gentlemen any longer. Are you ready, Mr. Slime?' "'And something more,' replied that worthy, rising. If you walk round to the office, we shall be there as soon as you. Tom, get a couch. The officer to whom he spoke departed for that purpose. 
Old Martin lingered for a few moments, as if he would have addressed some words to Jonas, but looking round and seeing him still seated on the floor, rocking himself in a savage manner to and fro, took Chuffey's arm and slowly followed Nadget out. John Westlock and Mark Tapley accompanied them. Mrs. Gamp had tottered out first for the better display of her feelings in a kind of walking swoon, for Mrs. Gamp performed swoons of different sorts upon a moderate notice, as Mr. Mould did funerals. Ah, muttered Slime, looking after them, upon my soul, as insensible of being disgraced by having such a nephew as myself in such a situation as if he was of my being an honour and a credit to the family. That's the return I get for having humbled my spirit, such a spirit as mine, to earn a livelihood, is it? He got up from his chair and kicked it away indignantly. And such a livelihood, too, when there are hundreds of men not fit to hold a candle to me, rolling in carriages and living on their fortunes. Upon my soul, it's a nice world." His eyes encountered Jonas, who looked earnestly towards him, and moved his lips as if he were whispering. "'Eh?' said Slime. Jonas glanced at the attendant whose back was towards him, and made a clumsy motion with his bound hands toward the door. "'Hm,' said Slime, thoughtfully. "'I couldn't hope to disgrace him into anything when you have shot so far ahead of me, though. I forgot that.' Jonas repeated the same look and gesture. "'Jack,' said Slime. "'Hello,' returned his man. "'Go down to the door, ready for the coach. Call it when it comes. I'd rather have you there. Now then,' he added, turning hastily to Jonas when the man was gone, "'what's the matter?' Jonas essayed to rise. "'Stop a bit,' said Slime. "'It's not so easy when your wrists are tight together. Now then, up. What is it?' "'Put your hand in my pocket. Here. The breast pocket on the left,' said Jonas. He did so, and drew out a purse. "'There's a hundred pound in it,' said Jonas, whose words were almost unintelligible, as his face in its pallor and agony was scarcely human. Slime looked at him, gave it into his hands, and shook his head. "'I can't. I daren't. I couldn't if I dared. Those fellows below—' "'Escape's impossible,' said Jonas. "'I know it. One hundred pounds for only five minutes in the next room.' "'What to do?' he asked. The face of his prisoner, as he advanced to whisper in his ear, made him recoil involuntarily, but he stopped and listened to him. The words were few, but his own face changed as he heard them. "'I have it about me,' said Jonas, putting his hands to his throat, as though whatever he referred to were hidden in his neckerchief. "'How should you know of it? How could you know? A hundred pound for only five minutes in the next room. The time's passing. Speak!' "'It would be more—more more creditable to the family,' observed Slime, with trembling lips. I wish you hadn't told me half so much. Less would have served your purpose. You might have kept it to yourself. A hundred pound for only five minutes in the next room. Speak! cried Jonas desperately. He took the purse. Jonas, with a wild, unsteady step, retreated to the door in the glass partitioned. Stop! cried Slime, catching at his skirts. I don't know about this. Yet it must end so at last. Are you guilty? Yes, said Jonas. "'Are the proofs as they were told just now?' "'Yes,' said Jonas. "'Will you—will you engage to say a, a prayer now, or something of that sort?' faltered Slime. Jonas broke from him without replying, and closed the door between them. Slime listened at the keyhole. After that he crept away on tiptoe, as far as he could, and looked awfully towards the place. He was roused by the arrival of the coach, and their letting down the steps— "'He's getting a few things together,' he said, leaning out of window and speaking to the two men below, who stood in the full light of a street-lamp. "'Keep your eye upon the back, one of you, for form's sake.' One of the men withdrew into the court. The other, seating himself on the steps of the coach, remained in conversation with Slime at the window, who perhaps had risen to be his superior in virtue of his old propensity, one so much lauded by the murdered man, of being always round the corner, a useful habit in his present calling." "'Where is he?' asked the man. Slime looked into the room for an instant and gave his head a jerk as much as to say, "'Close at hand, I see him.' "'He's booked,' observed the man. "'Through,' said Slime. They looked at each other and up and down the street. The man on the coach steps took his hat off and put it on again and whistled a little. "'I say, he's taking his time,' he remonstrated. "'I allowed him five minutes,' said Slime. "'Time's more than up, though. I'll bring him down.' He withdrew from the window accordingly, and walked on tiptoe to the door in the partition. He listened. There was not a sound within. He set the candles near it that they might shine through the glass. It was not easy, he found, to make up his mind to the opening of the door. 
but he flung it wide open suddenly and with a noise, then retreated. After peeping in and listening again, he entered. He started back as his eyes met those of Jonas, standing in an angle of the wall and staring at him. His neckerchief was off. His face was ashy pale. "'You're too soon,' said Jonas, with an abject whimper. "'I've not had time. I've not been able to do it. Five minutes more, two minutes more, only one.' Slime gave him no reply, but thrusting the purse upon him and forcing it back into his pocket, called up his men. He whined and cried and cursed and entreated them, and struggled and submitted in the same breath that had no power to stand. They got him away and into the couch, where they put him on a seat. But he soon fell moaning down among the straw at the bottom and lay there. The two men were with him, Slime being on the box with the driver, and they let him lie. Happening to pass a fruiterer's on their way, the door of which was open, though the shop was by this time shut, one of them remarked how faint the peaches smelled. The other assented at the moment, but presently stooped down in quick alarm and looked at the prisoner. "'Stop the coach! He has poisoned himself! The smell comes from this bottle in his hand!' The hand had shut upon it tight, with that rigidity of grasp which no living man in the full strength and energy of life can clutch a prize he has won. They dragged him out into the dark street, but jury, judge, and hangman could have done no more, and could do nothing now. Dead, dead, dead. End of chapter 51martin chuzzlewit chapter fifty two this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by brad philippone martin chuzzlewit by charles dickens chapter fifty two in which the tables are turned completely upside down old martin's cherished projects so long hidden in his own breast so frequently in danger of abrupt disclosure through the bursting forth of the indignation he had hoarded up during his residence with mr pecksniff were retarded but not beyond a few hours by the occurrences just now related stunned as he had been at first by the intelligence conveyed to him through tom pinch and john westlock of the supposed matter of his brother's death overwhelmed as he was by the subsequent narratives of chuffey and nadgett and the forging of that chain of circumstances ending in the death of jonas of which catastrophe he was immediately informed scattered as his purposes and hopes were for the moment by the crowding in of all these incidents between him and his end still their very intensity and the tumult of their assemblage nerved him to the rapid and unyielding execution of his scheme in every single circumstance, whether it were cruel, cowardly, or false, he saw the flowering of the same pregnant seed, self-grasping, eager, narrow-ranging, overreaching self, with its long train of suspicions, lusts, deceits, and all their growing consequences, was the root of the vile tree. Mr. Pecksniff had so presented his character before the old man's eyes, that he, the good, the tolerant, enduring Pecksniff, had become the incarnation of all selflessness and treachery, and the more odious the shapes in which those vices range themselves before him now, the sterner consolation he had in his design of setting Mr. Pecksniff right, and Mr. Pecksniff's victims too to this work he brought not only the energy and determination natural to his character which as the reader may have observed in the beginning of his or her acquaintance with this gentleman was remarkable for the strong development of those qualities but all the forced and unnaturally nurtured energy consequent upon their long suppression and these two tides of resolution setting into one and sweeping on became so strong and vigorous that to prevent themselves from being carried away before it heaven knows where was as much as john westlock and mark tapley together though they were tolerably energetic too could manage to effect he had sent for john westlock immediately on his arrival and john under the conduct of tom pinch had waited on him having a lively recollection of mr tapley he had caused that gentleman's attendance to be secured through john's means without delay and thus as we have seen they had all repaired together to the city 
but his grandson he had refused to see until to-morrow, when Mr. Tapley was instructed to summon him to the temple at ten o'clock in the forenoon. Tom he would not allow to be employed in anything lest he should be wrongfully suspected, but he was a party to all their proceedings, and was with them until late at night, until after they knew of the death of Jonas, when he went home to tell all these wonders to little Ruth, and to prepare her for accompanying him to the temple in the morning, agreeably to Mr. Chuzzlewit's particular injunction. It was characteristic of old Martin, and his looking on to something which he had distinctly before him, that he communicated to them nothing of his intentions beyond such hints of reprisal on Mr. Pecksniff as they gathered from the game he had played in that gentleman's house, and the brightening of his eyes whenever his name was mentioned. Even to John Westlock, in whom he was evidently disposed to place great confidence, which may indeed be said of every one of them, he gave no explanation whatever. He merely requested him to return in the morning, and with this for their utmost satisfaction they left him, when the night was far advanced, alone. The events of such a day might have worn out the body and spirit of a much younger man than he, but he sat in deep and painful meditation until the morning was bright, nor did he even then seek any prolonged repose, but merely slumbered in his chair until seven o'clock, when Mr. Tapley had appointed to come to him by his desire, and came as fresh and clean and cheerful as the morning itself. "'You are punctual,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit, opening the door to him in reply to his light knock, which had roused him instantly. "'My wishes, sir,' replied Mr. Tapley, whose mind would appear from the context to have been running on the matrimonial service, "'is to love, honour, and obey. The clocks are striking now, sir.' "'Come in.' "'Thank ye, sir,' rejoined Mr. Tapley. "'What could I do for you first, sir?' "'You gave my message to Martin,' said the old man, bending his eyes upon him. "'I did, sir,' returned Mark. "'And you never see a gentleman more surprised in all your born days than he was.' "'What more did you tell him?' Mr. Chuzzlewit inquired. "'Why, sir,' said Mr. Tapley, smiling, "'I should have liked to tell him a deal more, but not being able, sir, I didn't tell it him.' "'You told him all you knew?' "'But it was precious little, sir,' retorted Mr. Tapley. "'There was very little respect in you that I was able to tell him, sir. I only mentioned my opinion that Mr. Pecksniff would find himself deceived, sir, and that you would find yourself deceived, and that he would find himself deceived, sir.' "'In what?' asked Mr. Chuzzlewit. "'Meaning him, sir. Meaning both him and me.' "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Tapley, in your old opinions of each other. As to him, sir, and his opinions, I know he's a altered man. I know it. I knowed it long afore he spoke to you t'other day, and I must say it. Nobody don't know half as much of him as I do. Nobody can't. There was always a deal of good in him, but a little of it got crusted over somehow. I can't say who rolled the paste of that ere cross myself, but— Go on, said Martin. Why do you stop? "'But it—well, I beg your pardon, but I think it may have been you, sir. Unintentional, I think it may have been you. I don't believe that neither of you gave the other quite a fair chance. There, now I've got rid of it,' said Mr. Tapley, in a fit of desperation. "'I can't go a carrying it about my own mind, busting myself with it. Yesterday was quite long enough. It's out now. I can't help it. I'm sorry for it. Don't whiz it on him, sir. That's all.' It was clear that Mark expected to be ordered out immediately, and was quite prepared to go. "'So you think,' said Martin, "'that his old faults are in some degree of my creation, do you?' "'Well, sir,' retorted Mr. Tapley, "'I'm very sorry, but I can't unsay it. It's hardly fair of you, sir, to make an ignorant man convict himself in this way, but I do think so.' "'I am as respectful disposed to you, sir, as a man can be, but I do think so.' The light of a faint smile seemed to break through the dull steadiness of Martin's face as he looked attentively at him without replying. "'Yet you are an ignorant man, you say,' he observed after a long pause. "'Very much so,' Mr. Tapley replied. "'And I a learned, well-instructed man, you think?' "'Likewise very much so,' Mr. Tapley answered. The old man, with his chin resting on his hand, paced the room twice or thrice before he added, 
"'You have left him this morning. "'Come straight from him now, sir. "'For what does he suppose?' "'He don't know what to suppose, sir, no more than myself. "'I told him just what passed yesterday, sir, "'and that you had said to me, "'Can you be here by seven in the morning? "'And that you had said to him through me, "'Can you be here by ten in the morning? "'And that I had said yes to both, that's all, sir.' His frankness was so genuine that it plainly was all. "'Perhaps,' said Martin, "'he may think you are going to desert him, and to serve me.' "'I have served him in that sort of way, sir,' replied Mark, without the loss of any atom of his self-possession. "'And we have been that sort of companions in misfortune that my opinion is he don't believe a word on it. No more than you do, sir.' "'Will you help me to dress and get me some breakfast from the hotel?' asked Martin. "'With pleasure, sir,' said Mark. "'And by the by,' said Martin, "'remaining in the room as I wish you to do, "'will you attend to the door yonder, "'give admission to visitors, I mean, when they knock?' "'Certainly, sir,' said Mr. Tapley. "'You will not find it necessary to express surprise at their appearance,' Martin suggested. "'Oh, dear, no, sir,' said Mr. Tapley. "'Not at all.' Although he pledged himself to this with perfect confidence, he was in a state of unbounded astonishment even now. Martin appeared to observe it, had to have some sense of the ludicrous bearing of Mr. Tapley under these perplexing circumstances, for in spite of the composure of his voice and the gravity of his face, the same indistinct light flickered on the latter several times. Mark bestirred himself, however, to execute the offices with which he was entrusted, and soon lost all tendency to any outward expression of his surprise in the occupation of being brisk and busy. But when he had put Mr. Chuzzlewit's clothes in good order for dressing, and when that gentleman was dressed and sitting at his breakfast, Mr. Tapley's feelings of wonder began to return upon him with great violence, and standing beside the old man with a napkin under his arm, it was as natural and easy to joke to Mark to be a butler in the temple as it had been to volunteer as cook on board the screw, he found it difficult to resist the temptation of casting sidelong glances at him very often often. Nay, he found it impossible, and accordingly yielded to this impulse so often that Martin caught him in the fact some fifty times. The extraordinary things Mr. Tapley did with his own face when any of these detections occurred, the sudden occasions he had to rub his eyes or his nose or his chin, the look of wisdom with which he immediately plunged into the deepest thought, or became intensely interested in the habits and customs of the flies upon the ceiling, or the sparrows out of doors, or the overwhelming politeness with which he endeavoured to hide his confusion by handing the muffin, may not unreasonably be assumed to have exercised the utmost power of feature that even Martin Chuzzlewit the elder possessed. But he sat perfectly quiet and took his breakfast at his leisure, or made a show of doing so, for he scarcely ate or drank, and frequently lapsed into long intervals of musing. When he had finished, Mark sat down to his breakfast at the same table, and Mr. Chuzzlewit, quite silent still, walked up and down the room. Mark cleared away in due course and set a chair out for him, in which, as the time drew on towards ten o'clock, he took his seat, leaning his hands upon his stick and clenching them upon the handle, and resting his chin on them again. All his impatience and abstraction of manner had vanished now, and as he sat there, looking with his keen eyes steadily towards the door, Mark could not help thinking what a firm, square, powerful face it was, or exulting in the thought that Mr. Pecksniff, after playing a pretty long game of bowls with its owner, seemed to be at last in a very fair way of coming in for a rubber or two. Mark's uncertainty in respect of what was going to be done or said, and by whom to whom, would have excited him in itself. But knowing for a certainty besides that young Martin was coming, and in a very few minutes must arrive, he found it by no means easy to remain quiet and silent, but excepting that he occasionally coughed a hollow and unnatural manner to relieve himself, he behaved with great decorum through the longest ten minutes he had ever known. A knock at the door. Mr. Westlock. Mr. Tapley, in admitting him, raised his eyebrows to the highest possible pitch, implying thereby that he considered himself in an unsatisfactory position. Mr. Chuzzlewit received him very courteously. 
Mark waited at the door for Tom Pinch and his sister, who were coming up the stairs. The old man went to meet them, took their hands in his, and kissed her on the cheek. As this looked promising, Mr. Tapley smiled benignantly. Mr. Chuzzlewit had resumed his chair before young Martin, who was close behind them, entered. The old man, scarcely looking at him, pointed to a distant seat. This was less encouraging, and Mr. Tapley's spirits fell again. He was quickly summoned to the door by another knock. He did not start or cry or tumble down at sight of Miss Graham and Mrs. Lupin, but he drew a very long breath and came back perfectly resigned, looking on them and on the rest with an expression which seemed to say that nothing could surprise him any more, and that he was rather glad to have done with that sensation for ever. The old man received Mary no less tenderly than he had received Tom Pinch's sister. A look of friendly recognition passed between himself and Mrs. Lupin, which implied the existence of a perfect understanding between them. It engendered no astonishment in Mr. Tapley, for, as he afterwards observed, he had retired from the business and sold off the stock. Not the least curious feature in this assemblage was that everybody present was so much surprised and embarrassed by the sight of everybody else that nobody ventured to speak. Mr. Chuzzlewit alone broke silence. "'Set the door open, Mark,' he said, "'and come here.' Mark obeyed. The last appointed footsteps sounded now upon the stairs. They all knew it. It was Mr. Pecksniff's. And Mr. Pecksniff was in a hurry, too, for he came bounding up with such uncommon expedition that he stumbled twice or thrice. "'Where is my venerable friend?' he cried upon the upper landing, and then with open arms came darting in. Old Martin merely looked at him, but Mr. Pecksniff started back as if he had received the charge from an electric battery. "'My venerable friend is well,' cried Mr. Pecksniff. "'Quite well.' It seemed to reassure the anxious inquirer. He clasped his hand, and, looking upward with a pious joy, silently expressed his gratitude. He then looked round on the assembled group, and shook his head reproachfully for such a man severely, quite severely. "'Oh, vermin!' said Mr. Pecksniff. "'Oh, bloodsuckers! Is it not enough that you have embittered the existence of an individual wholly unparalleled in the biographical records of amiable persons, but must you now, even now, when he has made his election and reposed his trust in a numble, but at least sincere and disinterested relative, must you now, vermin and swarmers, I regret to make use of these strong expressions, my dear sir, but there are times when honest indignation will not be controlled, must you now, vermin and swarmers, for I will repeat it, and take advantage of his unprotected state, assemble round him from all quarters as wolves and vultures and other animals of the feathered tribe assemble round, I will not say round carrion or a carcass, for Mr. Chuzzlewit is quite the contrary, but round their prey, their prey to rifle and despoil, gorging their voracious maws, and straining their offensive beaks with every description of carnivorous enjoyment. As he stopped to fetch his breath, he waved them off in a solemn manner with his hand. "'Horde of unnatural plunderers and robbers,' he continued. "'Leave him, leave him, I say. Be gone, abscond. You had better be off. Wander over the face of the earth, young sirs, like vagabonds as you are, and do not presume to remain in a spot which is hallowed by the grey hairs of the patriarchal gentleman to whose tottering limbs I have the honour to act as an unworthy, but I hope an unassuming prop and staff.' "'And you, my tender sir,' said Pecksniff, addressing himself in a tone of gentle remonstrance to the old man, "'how could you ever leave me, for even this short period you have absented yourself, I do not doubt upon some act of kindness to me. Bless you for it, but you must not do it. You must not be so venturesome. I should really be angry with you if I could, my friend.' He advanced with outstretched arms to take the old man's hand but he had not seen how the hand clasped and clutched the stick within its grasp as he came smiling on and got within his reach old martin 
with his burning indignation crowded into one vehement burst, and flashing out of every line and wrinkle in his face, rose up and struck him down upon the ground, with such a well-directed nervous blow that down he went as heavily and true as if the charge of a life-guardsman had tumbled out of a saddle, and whether he was stunned by the shock or only confused by the wonder and novelty of this warm reception, he did not offer to get up again, but lay there, looking about him with a disconcerted meekness in his face so enormously ridiculous that neither Mark Tapley nor John Westlock could repress a smile, though both were actively interposing to prevent a repetition of the blow, which the old man's gleaming eyes and vigorous attitude seemed to render one of the most probable events in the world. "'Drag him away! Take him out of my reach!' said Martin, "'or I can't help it. The strong restraint I have put upon my hands has been enough to palsy them. I am not master of myself while he is within their range. Drag him away!' Seeing that he still did not rise, Mr. Tapley, without any compromise about it, actually did drag him away, stick him up on the floor, with his back against the opposite wall. "'Hear me, rascal,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit. "'I have summoned you here to witness your own work. I have summoned you here to witness it because I know it will be gall and wormwood to you. I have summoned you here to witness it, because I know the sight of everybody here must be a dagger in your mean false heart. What, do you know me as I am at last? Mr. Pecksniff had cause to stare at him, for the triumph in his face and speech and figure was a sight to stare at. Look there, said the old man, pointing at him and appealing to the rest. Look there, and then come here, my dear Martin. Look here, here, here. At every repetition of the word he pressed his grandson closer to his breast. "'The passion I felt, Martin, when I dared not do this,' he said, "'was in the blow I struck just now. Why did we ever part? How could we ever part? How could you ever fly from me to him?' Martin was about to answer, but he stopped him and went on. "'The fault was mine no less than yours. Mark has told me so to-day and I have known it long, though not so long as I might have done. Mary, my love, come here. As she trembled and was very pale, he sat her in his own chair and stood beside it with her hand in his, and Martin standing by him. The curse of our house, said the old man, looking kindly down upon her, has been the love of self, has ever been the love of self. How often have I said so, when I never knew that I had wrought it upon others? He drew one hand through Martin's arm, and, standing so between them, proceeded thus. "'You all know how I bred this orphan up to tend me. None of you can know by what degrees I have come to regard her as a daughter, for she has won upon me by her self-forgetfulness, her tenderness, her patience, all the goodness of her nature, when heaven is her witness that I took little pains to draw it forth. It blossomed without cultivation, and it ripened without heat. I cannot find it in my heart to say that I am sorry for it now, or yonder fellow might be holding up his head. Mr. Pecksniff put his hand into his waistcoat, and slightly shook that part of him to which allusion had been made, as if to signify that it was still uppermost. "'There is a kind of selfishness,' said Martin. "'I have learned it in my own experience of my own breast.' which is constantly upon the watch for selfishness in others, and holding others at a distance by suspicions and distrust, wonders why they don't approach and don't confide and cause that selfishness in them. Thus I once doubted those about me, not without reason in the beginning, and thus I once doubted you, Martin. Not without reason, Martin answered, either. Listen, hypocrite! "'Listen, smooth-tongued, servile, crawling knave,' said Martin. "'Listen, you shallow dog! What? When I was seeking him, you had already spread your nets. You were already fishing for him, were ye? When I lay ill in this good woman's house, and your meek spirit pleaded for my grandson, you had already caught him, had ye? Counting on the restoration of the love you knew I bore him, you designed him for one of your two daughters, did ye? 
or failing that you traded in him as a speculation which at any rate should blind me with the lustre of your charity and found a claim upon me why even then i knew you and told you so did i tell you that i knew you even then i am not angry sir said mr pecksniff softly i can bear a great deal from you i will never contradict you mr chuzzlewit observe said martin looking round i put myself in that man's hands on terms as mean and base and as degrading to himself as i could render them in words i started them at length to him before his own children syllable by syllable as coarsely as i could and with as much offence and with as plain an exposition of my contempt as words not looks and manner merely could convey if i had only called the angry blood into his face i would have wavered in my purpose if i had only stung him into being a man for a minute i would have abandoned it if he had offered me one word of remonstrance in favour of the grandson whom he supposed i had disinherited if he had pleaded with me though never so faintly against my appeal to him to abandon him to misery and cast him from his house i think i could have borne with him for ever afterwards but not a word not a word pandering to the worst of human passions was the office of his nature and faithfully he did his work i am not angry observed mr pecksniff i am hurt mr chuzzlewit wounded in my feelings but i am not angry my good sir mr chuzzlewit resumed once resolved to try him i was resolute to pursue the trial to the end but while i was bent on fathoming the depth of his duplicity i made a sacred compact with myself that i would give him credit on the other side for any latent spark of goodness honour forbearance any virtue that might glimmer in him for first to last there has been no such thing not once he cannot say i have not given him opportunity he cannot say i have ever led him on he cannot say i have not left him freely to himself in all things or that i have not been a passive instrument in his hands which he might have used for good as easily as evil or if he can he lies and that's his nature too mr chuzzlewit interrupted pecksniff shedding tears i am not angry sir i cannot be angry with you but did you never my dear sir express a desire that the unnatural young man who by his wicked arts has estranged your good opinion from me for the time being only for the time being that your grandson mr chuzzlewit should be dismissed my house recollect yourself my christian friend i have said so have i not retorted the old man sternly i could not tell how far your specious hypocrisy had deceived him knave and knew no better way of opening his eyes than by presenting you before him in your own servile character yes i did express that desire and you leapt to meet it and you met it and turning in an instant on the hand you had licked and beslavered as only such hounds can you strengthened and confirmed and justified me in my scheme Mr. Pecksniff made a bow, a submissive, not to say a groveling, and an abject bow. If he had been complimented on his practice of the loftiest virtues, he never could have bowed as he bowed then. "'The wretched man who has been murdered,' Mr. Chuzzlewit went on to say, "'then passing by the name of Tig,' suggested Mark, "'of Tig, brought begging messages to me on behalf of a friend of his,' and an unworthy relative of mine and finding him a man well enough suited to my purpose i employed him to glean some news of you martin for me it was from him that i learned you had taken up your abode with yonder fellow it was he who meeting you here in town one evening you remember where at the pawnbroker's shop said martin yes watched you to your lodging and enabled me to send you a bank-note i little thought said martin greatly moved that it had come from you i little thought that you were interested in my fate if i had if you had resumed the old man sorrowfully you would have shown less knowledge of me as i seemed to be and as i really was 
I hoped to bring you back, Martin, penitent and humbled. I hoped to distress you into coming back to me. Much as I loved you, I had that to acknowledge, which I could not reconcile it to myself to avow then, unless you made submission to me first. Thus it was I lost you. If I have had, indirectly, any act or part in the fate of that unhappy man, by putting means, however small, within his reach, heaven forgive me. I might have known, perhaps, that he would misuse money, that it was ill bestowed upon him, and that sown by his hands he could engender mischief only, but I never thought of him at that time as having the disposition or ability to be a serious impostor, or otherwise than as a thoughtless, idle humour, dissipated spendthrift, sinning more against himself than others, and frequenting low haunts and indulging vicious tastes to his own ruin only. "'Beggin' your pardon, sir,' said Mr. Tapley, who had Mrs. Lupin on his arm by this time, quite agreeably. "'If I may make so bold as say so, my opinion is, as you was quite correct, and that he turned out perfectly natural for all that. There's surprise a number of men, sir, who, as long as they've only got their own shoes and stockings to depend upon, will walk down hill along the gutters quiet enough and by themselves and not do much harm. But set any on em up with a coach and horses, sir, and it's wonderful what a knowledge of driving he'll show, and how he'll fill his vehicle with passengers and start off in the middle of the road, neck or nothing, to the devil. Bless your heart, sir, there's ever so many tigs a passin this here temple gate any hour of the day that only want a chance to turn out full blown Montagues every one. Your ignorance, as you call it, Mark, said Mr. Chuzzlewit is wiser than some men's enlightenment, and mine among them. You are right, and not for the first time to-day. Now hear me out, my dears, and hear me you, who, if what I have been told be accurately stated, are bankrupt in pocket no less than in good name. And when you have heard me, leave this place, and poison my sight no more. Mr. Pecksniff laid his hand upon his breast, and bowed again. "'The penance I have done in this house,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit, "'has earned this reflection with it constantly above all others, "'that if it had pleased heaven to visit such infirmity on my old age "'as really had reduced me to the state in which I feigned to be, "'I should have brought its misery upon myself. "'Oh, you whose wealth, like mine, has been a source of continual unhappiness, leading you to distrust the nearest and dearest, and to dig yourself a living grave of suspicion and reserve, take heed that, having cast off all whom you might have bound to you, and tenderly, you do not become in your decay the instrument of such a man as this, and waken in another world to the knowledge of such wrong as would embitter heaven itself, if wrong or you could ever reach it. And then he told them how he had sometimes thought in the beginning that love might grow between Mary and Martin, and how he had pleased his fancy with the picture of observing it when it was new, and taking them to task apart and counterfeited doubt, and then confessing to them that it had been an object dear to his heart, and by his sympathy with them and generous provision for their young fortunes, establishing a claim on their affection and regard which nothing should wither, and which should surround his old age with means of happiness. How in the first dawn of this design, and with the pleasure of such a scheme for the happiness of others, was new and indistinct within him, Martin had come to tell him that he had already chosen for himself, knowing that he, the old man, had some faint project on that head, but ignorant whom it concerned. How it was little comfort to him to know that Martin had chosen her, because the grace of his design was lost, and because finding that she had returned his love, he tortured himself with the reflection that they, so young, to whom he had been so kind a benefactor, were already like the world and bent on their own selfish, stealthy ends. How in the bitterness of this impression and of his past experience he had reproached Martin so harshly, forgetting that he never invited his confidence on such a point, and confounding what he had meant to do with what he had done, that high words sprung up between them, and they separated in wrath. How he loved him still, and hoped he would return! 
how on the night of his illness at the dragon he had secretly written tenderly of him, and made him his heir, and sanctioned his marriage with Mary, and how after his interview with Mr. Pecksniff he had distrusted him again, and burnt the paper to ashes, and had lain down in his bed distracted by suspicions, doubts, and regrets. And then he told them how, resolved to probe this Pecksniff, and to prove the constancy and truth of Mary, to himself no less than Martin, he had conceived and entered on his plan, and how beneath her gentleness and patience he had softened more and more, still more and more beneath the goodness and simplicity, the honour and the manly faith of Tom, and when he spoke of Tom he said, God bless him, and the tears were in his eyes, for he said that Tom, mistrusted and disliked by him at first, had come like summer rain upon his heart, and had disposed it to believe in better things, and Martin took him by the hand, and Mary too, and John, his old friend, stoutly too, and Mark and Mrs. Lupin and his sister, little Ruth, and peace of mind, deep, tranquil peace of mind, was in Tom's heart. The old men then related how nobly Mr. Pecksniff had performed the duty in which he stood indebted to society in the manner of Tom's dismissal, and how, having often heard disparagement of Mr. Westlock from Pecksniffian lips, and knowing him to be a friend to Tom, he had used, through his confidential agent and solicitor, that little artifice which had kept him in readiness to receive his unknown friend in London and he called on Mr. Pecksniff, by the name of Scoundrel, to remember that there again he had not trapped him to do evil, but that he had done it of his own free will and agency, nay, that he had cautioned him against it, and once again he called on Mr. Pecksniff, by the name of Hangdog, to remember that when Martin, coming home at last an altered man, had sued for the forgiveness which awaited him, he— Pecksniff had rejected him in language of his own, and had remorsely stepped in between him and the least touch of natural tenderness. "'For which,' said the old man, "'if the bending of my finger would remove a halter from your neck, I wouldn't bend it.' "'Martin,' he added, "'your rival has not been a dangerous one, but Mrs. Lupin here has played Joanna for some weeks.' not so much to watch your love as to watch her lover for that ghoul his fertility in finding names for mr pecksniff was astonishing would have crawled into her daily walks otherwise and polluted the fresh air what's this her hand is trembling strangely see if you can hold it hold it if he clasped it half as tightly as he did her waist well well but it was good in him that even then in his high fortune and happiness with her lips nearly printed on his own and her proud young beauty in his close embrace, he had a hand still left to stretch out to Tom Pinch. "'Oh, Tom! Dear Tom! I saw you accidentally coming here. Forgive me. Forgive!' cried Tom. "'I'll never forgive you as long as I live, Martin, if you say another syllable about it. Joy to you both! Joy, my dear fellow, fifty thousand times!' joy. There is not a blessing on earth that Tom did not wish them. There is not a blessing on earth that Tom would not have bestowed upon them if he could. "'I well, beg your pardon, sir,' said Mr. Tapley, stepping forward, "'but you was mentioning just now a lady of the name of Lupin, sir.' "'I was,' returned old Martin. "'Yes, sir, it's a pretty name, sir.' "'A very good name,' said Martin. "'It seems a most pity to change such a name into Tapley, don't it, sir?' said Mark. "'That depends upon the lady.' "'Why, sir,' said Mr. Tapley, retiring with a bow towards the buxom hostess, "'her opinion is as the name ain't a change for the better, but the individual may, and therefore, if nobody ain't acquainted with no jest cause or impediment, etc., the blue dragon will be converted into the jolly Tapley, a sort of my own invention, sir.' Weary new, convivial, and expressive. The hold of these proceedings were so agreeable to Mr. Pecksniff that he stood with his eyes fixed upon the floor and his hands clasping one another alternately, as if a host of penal sentences were being passed upon him. Not only did his figure appear to have shrunk, 
but his discomfiture seemed to have extended itself even to his dress, his clothes seemed to have grown shabbier, his linen to have turned yellow, his hair to have become lank and frowsy, his very boots looked villainous and dim, as if their gloss had departed with his own. Feeling, rather than seeing, that the old man now pointed to the door, he raised his eyes, picked up his hat, and thus addressed him. "'Mr. Chuzzlewit, sir, you have partaken of my hospitality—' "'And paid for it,' he observed. "'Thank you. That savours, said Mr. Pecksniff, taking out his pocket-handkerchief, "'of your old familiar frankness. You have paid for it. I was about to make the remark. You have deceived me, sir. Thank you again.' I am glad of it. To see you in the possession of your health and faculties on any terms is in itself a sufficient recompense. To have been deceived implies a trusting nature. Mine is a trusting nature. I am thankful for it. I would rather have a trusting nature, do you know, than a doubting one. Here Mr. Pecksniff, with a sad smile, bowed and wiped his eyes. "'There is hardly any person present, Mr. Chuzzlewit,' said Pecksniff, "'by whom I have not been deceived. "'I have forgiven those persons on the spot. "'That was my duty, and, of course, I have done it. "'Whether it was worthy of you to partake of my hospitality, "'and to act the part you did act in my house, "'that, sir, is a question which I leave to your own conscience, "'and your conscience does not acquit you. "'No, sir, no.' Pronouncing these last words in a loud and solemn voice, Mr. Pecksniff was not so absolutely lost in his own fervour as to be unmindful of the expediency of getting a little nearer to the door. "'I have been struck this day,' said Mr. Pecksniff, "'with a walking-stick, which I have every reason to believe has knobs upon it, on that delicate and exquisite portion of the human anatomy, the brain, several blows have been inflicted, sir, without a walking-stick, upon that tenderer portion of my frame, my heart. You have mentioned, sir, my being bankrupt in my purse. Yes, sir, I am. By an unfortunate speculation, combined with treachery, I find myself reduced to poverty, at a time, sir, when the child of my bosom is widowed, and affliction and disgrace are in my my family. Here Mr. Pecksniff wiped his eyes again, and gave himself two or three little knocks upon the breast, as if he were answering two or three little other knocks from within, given by the tinkling hammer of his conscience, to express, cheer up, my boy. I know the human mind, although I trust it. That is my weakness. Do I not know, sir? Here he became exceedingly plaintive, and was observed to glance towards Tom Pinch, that my misfortunes bring this treatment on me, do I not know, sir, that but for them I never should have heard what I have heard to-day? Do I not know that in the silence and solitude of night a little voice will whisper in your ear, Mr. Chuzzlewit, this was not well, this was not well, sir? Think of this, sir, if you will have the goodness, remote from the impulses of passion and apart from the specialities, if I may use that strong remark, of prejudice. And if you ever contemplate the silent tomb, sir, which you will excuse me for entertaining some doubt of your doing after the conduct into which you have allowed your Self to be betrayed this day. If you ever contemplate the silent tomb, sir, think of me. If you find yourself approaching to the silent tomb, sir, think of me. If you should wish to have anything inscribed upon your silent tomb, sir, let it be that I, ah, my remorseful sir, that I, the humble individual who has now the honour of reproaching you, forgave you, that I forgave you when my injuries were fresh, and when my bosom was newly wrung. It may be bitterness to you to hear it now, sir, but you will live to seek a consolation in it. May you find a consolation in it when you want it, sir. Good morning. With this sublime address, Mr. Pecksniff departed. But the effect of his departure was much impaired by being immediately afterwards run against and nearly knocked down by a monstrously excited little man in velveteen shorts and a very tall hat, who came bursting up the stairs straight into the chambers of Mr. Chuzzlewit as if he were deranged. Is there anybody here that knows him? cried the little man. "'Is there anybody here that knows him? Oh, my stars, is there anybody here that knows him?' 
They looked at each other for an explanation, but nobody knew anything more than here was an excited little man, with a very tall hat on, running in and out of the room as hard as he could go, making his single pair of bright blue stockings appear at least a dozen, and constantly repeating in a shrill voice, "'Is there anybody here that knows him?' "'If your brains is not turned Tobsy turgy Mr. Sweedlepipes,' exclaimed another voice, "'hold that there knife of yourn. I beg you, sir!' At the same time Mrs. Gamp was seen in the doorway, out of breath from coming up so many stairs, and panting fearfully but dropping curtsies to the last. "'Excuse the weakness of the man,' said Mrs. Gamp, eyeing Mr. Sweedlepipe with great indignation. "'And, well, I might expect it, as I should have knowed, and wishin' he was drownded in the Thames afore I had brought him here, which not a blessed hour ago he nearly shaved the noge off from the father of as lovely a family as ever Mr. Chuzzlewit was born three sets of twins, and would have done it, only he see it a-goin' in the glass and dodge the ranger. And never, Mr. Sweedlepipes, I do assure you, did I so well know what a misfortune it was to be acquainted with you as now I do, which so I say, sir, and I don't deceive you. I ask your pardon, ladies and gentlemen, all, cried the little barber, taking off his hat, and yours too, Mrs. Gamp, but, but, he added this half laughing and half crying, is there anybody here that knows him? As the barber said these words, a something in top boots with its head bandaged up staggered into the room and began going round and round and round, apparently under the impression that it was walking straight forward. "'Look at him!' cried the excited little barber. "'Here he is. That'll soon wear off, and then he'll be all right again. He's no more dead than I am. He's all alive and hearty. Ain't you, Bailey?' Uh, "'Rather so, Paul,' replied that gentleman. "'Look here!' cried the little barber, laughing and crying in the same breath. "'When I steady him, he comes all right. There, he's all right now. Nothing's the matter with him now, except that he's a little shook and rather giddy. Is there, Bailey?' "'Rather, rather shook, Paul. Rather so,' said Mr. Bailey. "'Why, my lovely Sarie, there you are.' "'What a boy he is!' cried the tender-hearted Paul, actually sobbing over him. "'I never see such a boy. It's all his fun. He's full of it. He shall go into the business along with me. I am determined he shall. We'll make it Sweedlepipe and Bailey. He shall have the sporting branch. What a one he'll be for the matches, and me the shaven. I'll make over the birds to him as soon as ever he's well enough. He shall have the little bullfinch in the shop and all. He's such a boy. I ask your pardon, ladies and gentlemen, but I thought there might be some one here that knowed him.' Mrs. Gamp had observed, not without jealousy and scorn, that a favourable impression appeared to exist in behalf of Mr. Sweedlepipe and his young friend, and that she had fallen rather into the background in consequence. She now struggled to the front, therefore, and stated her business. "'Which, Mr. Chuzzlewit,' she said, "'it is well beknown to Mrs. Harris as has one sweet infant, though she do not wish it known, in her own family by the mother's side kept in spirits in a bottle and that sweet babe she see at greenwich fair a travelling in company with a pink-eyed lady prussian dwarf and living skellington which judge her feelings when the barrel organ played and she was showed her own dear sister's child the same not being expected from the outside picture where it was painted quite contrary in a living state as many sizes larger and performing beautiful upon the harp, which never did that dear child know or do since breath it never did to speak on in this well and mrs harris mr chuzzlewit has known me many year and can give you information that the lady which is widowed can't do better and may do worse than let me wait upon her which i hope to do permitted the sweet faces as i see afore me oh said mr chuzzlewit is that your business was this good person paid for the trouble we gave her i paid her sir returned mark tapley liberal the young man's words is true said mrs gamp and thank you kindly 
"'Then here we will close our acquaintance, Mrs. Gap,' retorted Mr. Chuzzlewit. "'And Mr. Sweedlepipe, is that your name?' "'That's my name, sir,' replied Paul, accepting with a profusion of gratitude some chinking pieces which the old man slipped into his hand. "'Mr. Sweedlepipe, take as much care of your lady lodger as you like, and give her a word or two of good advice now and then. Such,' said old Martin, looking gravely at the astonished Mrs. Gamp, "'as hinting at the expediency of a little less liquor, and a little more humanity, and a little less regard for herself, and a little more regard for her patience, and perhaps a trifle of additional honesty. Or, when Mrs. Gamp gets into trouble, Mr. Sweedlepipe, it had better not be at a time when I am near enough to the old Bailey to volunteer myself as witness to her character. Endeavour to impress that upon her at your leisure, if you please.' Mrs. Gamp clasped her hands, turned up her eyes until they were quite invisible, threw back her bonnet for the admission of fresh air to her heated brow, and in the act of saying faintly, "'Less liquor, Sarry Gamp, bottle on the chimney-piece, and let me put my lips to it when I am so disposed," fell into one of the walking swoons in which pitiable state she was conducted forth by Mr. Sweedlepipe, who, between his two patients, the swooning Mrs. Gamp and the revolving Bailey, had enough to do, poor fellow. The old man looked about him with a smile, until his eyes rested on Tom Pinch's sister, when he smiled the more. "'We will all dine here together,' he said, "'and as you and Mary have enough to talk of, Martin, "'you shall keep house for us until the afternoon "'with Mr. and Mrs. Tapley. "'I must see your lodgings in the meanwhile, Tom.' "'Tom was quite delighted. "'So was Ruth. "'She would go with them. "'Thank you, my love,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit. "'But I am afraid I must take Tom a little out of the way on business.' "'Suppose you go on first, my dear.' Pretty little Ruth was equally delighted to do that. "'But not alone,' said Martin. "'Not alone. Mr. Westlock, I dare say, will escort you.' "'Why, of course he would. What else had Mr. Westlock in his mind? How dull these old men are!' "'You are sure you have no engagement?' he persisted. "'Engagement? As if he could have any engagement.' So they went off arm in arm. When Tom and Mr. Chuzzlewit went off arm in arm a few minutes after them, the latter was still smiling, and really, for a gentleman of his habits, in rather a knowing manner. End of chapter 52《Martin Chuzzlewit》Chapter 53 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens, Chapter 53 What John Westlock Said to Tom Pinch's Sister What Tom Pinch's Sister Said to John Westlock What Tom Pinch Said to Both of Them And How They All Passed the Remainder of the Day Brilliantly the temple fountain sparkled in the sun, and laughingly its liquid music played, and merrily the idle drops of water danced and danced, and peeping out in sport among the trees, plunged lightly down to hide themselves as little Ruth and her companion came toward it. And why they came toward the fountain at all is a mystery, for they had no business there. It was not in their way. It was quite out of their way. They had no more to do with the fountain, bless you, than they had with—with with love, or any out-of-the-way thing of that sort. It was all very well for Tom and his sister to make appointments by the fountain, but that was quite another affair, because, of course, when she had to wait a minute or two, it would have been very awkward for her to have to wait in any but a tolerably quiet spot, but that was as quiet a spot, everything considered, as they could choose. But when she had John Westlock to take care of her, and was going home with her arm in his, home being a different direction altogether, their coming anywhere near that fountain was quite extraordinary. However, there they found themselves. And another extraordinary part of the matter was that they seemed to have come there by a silent understanding. Yet when they got there they were a little confused by being there, which was the strangest part of all, because there is nothing naturally confusing in a fountain. We all know that. "'What a good old place it was,' John said. 
with quite an earnest affection for it. "'A pleasant place indeed,' said little Ruth. "'So shady. Oh, wicked little Ruth!' They came to a stop when John began to praise it. The day was exquisite, and stopping at all it was quite natural, nothing could be more so, that they should glance down Garden Court, because Garden Court ends in the garden, and the garden ends in the river, and that glimpse is very bright and fresh and shining on a summer's day. Then, oh, little Ruth, why not look boldly at it? Why fit that tiny, precious, blessed little foot into the cracked corner of an insensible old flagstone in the pavement, and be so very anxious to adjust it to a nicety? If the fiery-faced matron in the crunched bonnet could have seen them as they walked away, how many years' purchase might fiery-face have been disposed to take for her situation in Furnival's Inn as laundress to Mr. Westlock? They went away, but not through London streets, through some enchanted city where the pavements were of air, where all the rough sounds of a stirring town were softened into gentle music, where everything was happy, where there was no distance and no time. They were two good-tempered, burly draymen letting down big butts of bear into a cellar somewhere and when john helped her almost lifted her the lightest easiest neatest thing you ever saw across the rope they said he owed them a good turn for giving him the chance celestial draymond green pastures in the summer tide deep littered straw yards in the winter no start of corn and clover ever to that noble horse who would dance on the pavement with a gig behind him and who frightened her and made her clasp his arm with both hands both hands meeting one upon the other so endearingly and caused her to implore him to take refuge in the pastry-cooks, and afterwards to peep out at the door so shrinkingly, and then looking at her with those eyes to ask him he was sure, now he was sure, they might go safely on. Oh, for a string of rampant horses, for a lion, for a bear, for a mad bull, for anything to bring the little hands together on his arm again. They talked of Tom, and all these changes, and the attachment Mr. Chuzzlewit had conceived for him, and the bright prospects he had in such a friend, and a great deal more to the same purpose. The more they talked, the more afraid this fluttering little Ruth became of any pause, and sooner than have a pause she would say the same things over again, and if she had encouraged or presence of mind enough for that, to say the truth she very seldom had, she was ten thousand times more charming and irresistible than she had been before. "'Martin will be married very soon now, I suppose,' said John. She supposed he would. Never did a bewitching little woman suppose anything in such a faint voice as Ruth supposed that. But seeing that another of those alarming pauses was approaching, she remarked that he would have a beautiful wife. Didn't Mr. Westlock think so? "'Yes,' said John. "'Oh, yes.' She feared he was rather hard to please he spoke so coldly. "'Rather say, already pleased,' said John. "'I have scarcely seen her. I had no care to see her. I had no eyes for her this morning. Oh, good gracious!' It was where well they had reached their destination. She never could have gone any further. It would have been impossible to walk in such a tremble. Tom had not come in. They entered the triangular parlour together and alone. Fiery face, fiery face, how many years purchase now! She sat down on the little sofa and untied her bonnet-strings. He sat down by her side, and very near her, very, very near her. Oh, rapid, swelling, bursting little heart, you knew that it would come to this, and hoped it would. Why beat so wildly, heart? Dear Ruth, sweet Ruth, if I have loved you less, I could have told you that I loved you long ago. I have loved you from the first. There never was a creature in the world more truly loved than you, dear Ruth, by me. She clasped her little hands before her face. The gushing tears of joy and pride and hope and innocent affection would not be restrained. Fresh from her full young heart they came to answer him. My dear love, if this is, I almost dare to hope it is now, not painful or distressing to you, you make me happier than I can tell or you imagine. 
Darling Ruth, my own good, gentle, winning Ruth, I hope I know the value of your heart. I hope I know the worth of your angel nature. Let me try and show you that I do, and you will make me happier, Ruth. Not happier, she sobbed, than you make me. No one can be happier, John, than you make me. Fiery face, provide yourself. The usual wages or the usual warning. It's all over, fiery face. We needn't trouble you any further. The little hands could meet each other now without a rampant horse to urge them. There was no occasion for lions, bears, or mad bulls. It could all be done and infinitely better without their assistance. No burly draymen or big butts of beer were wanted for apologies. No apology at all was wanted. The soft light touch fell coyly, but quite naturally, upon the lover's shoulder. The delicate waist, the drooping head, the blushing cheek, the beautiful eyes, the exquisite mouth itself, were all as natural as possible. If all the horses in Araby had run away at once, they could not have improved upon it. They soon began to talk of Tom again. "'I hope he will be glad to hear of it,' said John, with sparkling eyes. Ruth drew the little hands a little tighter when he said it, and looked up seriously into his face. "'I am never to leave him, am I, dear? I could never leave Tom. I am sure you know that.' "'Do you think I would ask you?' he returned with a, well, never mind with what. "'I am sure you never would,' she answered, the bright tears standing in her eyes. "'And I will swear it, Ruth, my darling, if you please. Leave Tom, that would be a strange beginning. Leave Tom, dear. If Tom and we be not inseparable, and Tom, God bless him, have not all honour and all love in our home, my little wife, may that home never be.' "'And that's a strong oath, Ruth. "'Shall it be recorded how she thanked him? "'Yes, it shall. "'In all simplicity and innocence and purity of heart, "'yet with a timid, graceful, half-determined hesitation, "'she set a little rosy seal upon the vow, "'whose colour was reflected in her face "'and flashed up to the braiding of her dark brown hair. "'Tom will be so happy.' "'And so proud and glad,' she said, clasping her little hands. "'But so surprised. I am sure he had never thought of such a thing.' "'Of course John asked her immediately, because you know they were in that foolish state when great allowances must be made, when she had begun to think of such a thing, and this made a little diversion in their talk, a charming diversion to them, but not so interesting to us, at the end of which they came back to Tom again.' "'Ah, dear Tom,' said Ruth, "'I suppose I ought to tell you everything now. I should have no secrets from you, should I, John, love?' It is of no use saying how preposterous John answered her, because he answered in a manner which is untranslatable on paper, though highly satisfactory in itself. But what he conveyed was, "'No, no, no, sweet Ruth,' or something to that effect. Then she told him Tom's great secret, not exactly saying how she had found it out, but leaving him to understand it if he liked, and John was sadly grieved to hear it, and full of sympathy and sorrow, but they would try, he said, only the more on this account to make him happy, and to beguile him with his favourite pursuits, and then, in all the confidence of such a time, he told her how he had a capital opportunity of establishing himself in his old profession in the country, and how he had been thinking in the event of that happiness coming upon him which had actually come, there was another slight diversion here, how he had been thinking that would afford occupation to Tom, and enable them to live together in the easiest manner without any sense of dependence on Tom's part, and to be as happy as the day was long, and Ruth, receiving this with joy, they went on catering for Tom to that extent that they had already purchased him a select library and built him an organ, on which he was performing with the greatest satisfaction when they heard him knocking at the door. Though she longed to tell them what had happened, poor little Ruth was greatly agitated by his arrival, the more so because she knew that Mr. Chuzzlewit was with him. So she said, all in a tremble, "'What shall I do, dear John?' I can't bear that he should hear it from any one but me, and I could not tell him unless we were alone. Do, my love, said John, whatever is natural to you on the impulse of the moment, and I am sure it will be right. 
he had hardly time to say thus much, and Ruth had hardly time to, just to get a little farther off, upon the sofa, when Tom and Mr. Chuzzlewit came in. Mr. Chuzzlewit came first, and Tom was a few seconds behind him. Now Ruth had hastily resolved that she would beckon Tom upstairs after a short time, and would tell him in his little bedroom. But when she saw his dear old face come in, his heart was so touched that she ran into his arms and laid her head down on his breast and sobbed out, "'Bless me, Tom, my dearest brother!' Tom looked up in surprise, and saw John Westlock close behind him, holding out his hand. "'John!' cried Tom. "'John!' "'Dear Tom,' said his friend, "'give me your hand. We are brothers, Tom.' Tom wrung it with all his force, embraced his sister fervently, and put her in John Westlock's arms. "'Don't speak to me, John. Heaven is very good to us. I—' Tom could find no further utterance, but left the room, and Ruth went after him. And when they came back, which they did by and by, she looked more beautiful, and Tom more good and true, if that were possible, than ever. And though Tom could not speak upon the subject even now, being yet too newly glad, he put both his hands in both of John's with emphasis sufficient for the best speech ever spoken. "'I am glad you chose to-day,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit to John, with the same knowing smile as when they had left him. "'I thought you would. I hoped Tom and I lingered behind a discreet time. It's so long since I had any practical knowledge of these subjects that I have been anxious, I assure you.' "'Your knowledge is still pretty accurate, sir,' returned John, laughing, "'if it led you to foresee what would happen today. "'I—I I am not sure, Mr. Westlock,' said the old man, "'that any great spirit of prophecy was needed after seeing you and Ruth together. "'Come hither, pretty one. "'See what Tom and I purchased this morning "'while you were dealing in exchange with that young merchant there.' The old man's way of sitting her beside him, and humouring his voice as if she were a child, was whimsical enough, but full of tenderness, and not ill-adapted, somehow, to little Ruth. "'See here,' he said, taking a case from his pocket, "'what a beautiful necklace! Ah, how it glitters! Earrings, too, and bracelets, and a zone for your waist! This set is yours, and Mary has another like it.' Tom couldn't understand why I wanted two. What a short-sighted Tom! Earrings and bracelets and a zone for your waist. Ah, beautiful! Let us see how brave they look. Ask Mr. Westlock to clasp them on. It was the prettiest thing to see her holding out her round white arm, and John, oh, deep, deep John, pretending that the bracelet was very hard to fasten, it was the prettiest thing to see her girding on the precious little zone, and yet obliged to have assistance because her fingers were in such terrible perplexity. It was the prettiest thing to see her so confused and bashful, with the smiles and blushes playing brightly on her face, like the sparkling light upon the jewels. It was the prettiest thing that you would see in the common experiences of a twelve-month, rely upon it. "'The set of jewels and the wearer are so well matched,' said the old man, "'that I don't know what becomes the other most. Mr. Westlock could tell me I have no doubt, but I'll not ask him, for he is bribed. Health to wear them, my dear, and happiness to make you forgetful of them, except as a remembrance from a loving friend.' He patted her upon the cheek, and said to Tom, "'I must play the part of a father here, Tom, also. There are not many fathers who marry two such daughters on the same day, but we will overlook the improbability for the gratification of an old man's fancy. I may claim that much indulgence,' he added, "'for I have gratified few fancies enough in my life tending to the happiness of others, heaven knows.' These various proceedings had occupied so much time, and they fell into such a pleasant conversation now, that it was within a quarter of an hour of the time appointed for dinner before any of them thought about it. A hackney-coach soon carried them to the temple, however, and there they found everything prepared for their reception. 
Mr. Tapley, having been furnished with unlimited credentials relative to the ordering of dinner, had so exerted himself for the honour of the party that a prodigious banquet was served under the joint direction of himself and his intended. Mr. Chuzzlewit would have had them of the party, and Martin urgently seconded his wish, but Mark could by no means be persuaded to sit down at table, observing that in having the honour of attending to their comforts he felt himself indeed the landlord of the jolly Tapley, and could almost delude himself into the belief that the entertainment was actually being held under the jolly Tapley's roof. For the better encouragement of himself in this fable, Mr. Tapley took it upon him to issue divers general directions to the waiters from the hotel relative to the disposal of the dishes and so forth, and as they were unusually in direct opposition to all precedent, and were always issued in his most facetious form of thought and speech, they occasioned great merriment among those attendants, in which Mr. Tapley participated with an infinite enjoyment of his own humour. He likewise entertained them with short anecdotes of his travels appropriate to the occasion, and now and then with some comic passage or other between himself and Mrs. Lupin, so that explosives last were constantly issuing from the sideboard and from the backs of chairs, and the head waiter, who wore powder and knee-smalls and was usually a grave man, got to be a bright scarlet in the face and broke his waistcoat-strings audibly. Young Martin sat at the head of the table, and Tom Pinch at the foot, and if there were a genial face at that board it was Tom's. They all took their tone from Tom. Everybody drank to him, everybody looked to him, everybody thought of him, everybody loved him. If he so much as laid down his knife and fork somebody put out a hand to shake with him, Martin and Mary had taken him aside before dinner, and spoken to him so heartily of the time to come, laying such fervent stress upon the trust they had in his completion of their felicity, by his society and closest friendship, that Tom was positively moved to tears. He couldn't bear it. His heart was full, he said, of happiness, and so it was. Tom spoke the honest truth. It was. Large as thy heart was, dear Tom Pinch, it had no room that day for anything but happiness and sympathy. And there was Phipps, old Phipps of Austin Friars, present at the dinner, and turning out to be the jolliest old dog that ever did violence to his convivial sentiments by shutting himself up in a dark office. "'Where is he?' said Phipps when he came in, and then he pounced on Tom and told him that he wanted to relieve himself of all his old constraint, and in the first place shook him by one hand, and in the second place shook him by the other, and in the third place nudged him in the waistcoat, and in the fourth place said, "'How are you?' and did a great many other places, did a great many other things to show his friendliness and joy. And he sang songs, did Fip, and made speeches, did Phipps, and knocked off his wine pretty handsomely, did Phipps, and, in short, he showed himself to be a perfect trump, did Fops, in all respects. But, ah, uh, the happiness of strolling home at night! Obstinate little Ruth she wouldn't hear of riding, as they had done on that dear night from Furnival's Inn. The happiness of being able to talk about it and to confide their happiness to each other. The happiness of stating all their little plans to Tom and seeing his bright face grow brighter as they spoke. When they reached home, Tom left John and his sister in the parlour, and went upstairs into his room under pretense of seeking a book. And Tom actually winked to himself when he got upstairs. He thought it such a deep thing to have done. "'They like to be by themselves, of course,' said Tom, "'and I came away so naturally that I have no doubt they are expecting me every moment to return. That's capital.' But he had not sat reading very long, when he heard a tap at his door. "'May I come in?' said John. "'Oh, surely,' Tom replied. "'Don't leave us, Tom. Don't sit by yourself. We want to make you merry, not melancholy.' "'My dear friend,' said Tom, with a cheerful smile. "'Brother, Tom, brother!' "'My dear brother,' said Tom, "'there is no danger of my being melancholy. How can I be melancholy when I know that you and Ruth are so blessed in each other?' "'I think I can find my tongue to-night, John,' he added after a moment's pause. "'But I never can tell you what unutterable joy this day has given me. 
it would be unjust to you to speak of your having chosen a portionless girl for i feel you know her worth i am sure you know her worth nor will it diminish in your estimation john which money might which money would tom he returned her worth oh who could see her here and not love her who could know her tom and not honour her who could ever stand possessed of such a heart as hers and grow indifferent to the treasure who could feel the rapture that i feel to-day and love as i love her tom without knowing something of her worth your joy unutterable no no tom it's mine it's mine no no john said tom it's mine it's mine their friendly contention was brought to a close by little ruth herself who came peeping in at the door and oh the look the glorious half-pound half-tivet look she gave tom when her lover drew her to his side as much as to say yes indeed tom he will do it but then he has a right you know because i am fond of him tom as to tom he was perfectly delighted he could have sat and looked at them just as they were for hours i have told tom love as we agreed that we are not going to permit him to run away and that we cannot possibly allow it the loss of one person and such a person as tom too out of our small household of three is not to be endured and so i have told him whether he is considerate or whether he is only selfish i don't know but he needn't be considerate for he is not the least restraint upon us is he dearest ruth well he really did not seem to be any particular restraint upon them judging from what ensued was it folly in Tom to be so pleased by their remembrance of him at such a time? Was their grateful love a folly? Were their dear caresses follies? Was their lengthened parting folly? Was it folly in him to watch her window from the street, and rate its scantiest gleam of light above all diamonds? Folly in her to breathe his name upon her knees, and pour out her pure heart before that being from whom such hearts and such affections come? If these be follies, then fiery face go on and prosper. If they be not, then fiery face avaunt. But set the crunched bonnet at some other single gentleman in any case, for one is lost to thee for ever. End of chapter 53「Martin Chuzzlewit, Chapter 54 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens, Chapter 54. Gives the author great concern, for it is the last in the book. Todgers was in high feather, and mighty preparations for a late breakfast were astir in its commercial bowers. The blissful morning had arrived when Miss Pecksniff was to be united in holy matrimony to Augustus miss pecksniff was in a frame of mind equally becoming to herself and the occasion she was full of clemency and conciliation she had laid in several cauldrons of live coals and was prepared to heap them on the heads of her enemies she bore no spite nor malice in her heart not the least quarrels miss pecksniff said were dreadful things in families and though she never could forgive her dear papa, she was willing to receive her other relations. They had been separated, she observed, too long. It was enough to call down a judgment upon the family. She believed the death of Jonas was a judgment on them for their internal dissensions, and Miss Pecksniff was confirmed in this belief by the lightness with which the visitation had fallen on herself. By way of doing sacrifice, not in triumph, not of course in triumph, but in humiliation of spirit, this amiable young person wrote, therefore, to her kinswoman of the strong mind, and informed her that her nuptials would take place on such a day, that she had been much hurt by the unnatural conduct of herself and daughters, and hoped they might not have suffered in their consciences, that, being desirous to forgive her enemies, and make her peace with the world before entering into the most solemn of covenants with the most devoted of men, she now held out the hand of friendship. 
that if the strong-minded women took that hand in the temper in which it was extended to her, she, Miss Pecksniff, did invite her to be present at the ceremony of her marriage, and did furthermore invite the three red-nosed spinsters, her daughters, but Miss Pecksniff did not particularize their noses, to attend as bridesmaids. The strong-minded women returned for answer that herself and daughters were, as regarded their consciences, in the enjoyment of robust health, which she knew Miss Pecksniff would be glad to hear. That she had received Miss Pecksniff's note with unalloyed delight, because she never had attached the least importance to the paltry and insignificant jealousies with which herself and circle had been assailed, otherwise than as she found them, in the contemplation, a harmless source of innocent mirth that she would joyfully attend miss pecksniff's bridal and that her three dear daughters would be happy to assist on so interesting and so very unexpected which the strong-minded woman underlined so very unexpected an occasion on the receipt of this gracious reply miss pecksniff extended her forgiveness and her invitations to mr and mrs spottletoe to mr george chuzzlewit the bachelor cousin to the solitary female who usually had the toothache and to the hairy young gentleman with the outline of a face surviving remnants of the party that had once assembled in miss pecksniff's parlour after which miss pecksniff remarked that there was a sweetness in doing our duty which neutralized the bitter in our cups the wedding guests had not yet assembled and indeed it was so early that miss pecksniff herself was in the act of dressing at her leisure when a carriage stopped near the monument and mark dismounting from the rumble assisted mr chuzzlewit to alight the carriage remained in waiting as did mr tapley mr chuzzlewit betook himself to todgers he was shown by the degenerate successor of mr bailey into the dining parlour where for the visit was expected mrs todgers immediately appeared you are dressed i see for the wedding he said mrs todgers who was greatly flurried by the preparations replied in the affirmative it goes against my wishes to have it in progress just now i assure you sir said mrs todgers but miss pecksniff's mind was set upon it and it really is time that miss pecksniff was married that cannot be denied sir no said mr chuzzlewit assuredly not her sister takes no part of the proceedings oh dear no sir poor thing said mrs todgers shaking her head and dropping her voice said she has known the worst she has never left my room the next room is she prepared to see me he inquired quite prepared sir then let us lose no time Mrs. Todgers conducted him into the little back chamber commanding the prospect of the cistern, and there, sadly different from when it had been first her lodging, sat poor Mary in mourning weeds. The room looked very dark and sorrowful, and so did she. But she had one friend beside her, faithful to the last, old Chuffy. When Mr. Chuzzlewit sat down at her side, she took his hand and put it to her lips she was in great grief he too was agitated for he had not seen her since their parting in the churchyard i judged you hastily he said in a low voice i fear i judged you cruelly let me know that i have your forgiveness she kissed his hand again and retaining it in hers thanked him in a broken voice for all his kindness to her sense tom pinch said martin has faithfully related to me all that you desired him to convey at a time when he deemed it very improbable that he would ever have an opportunity of delivering your message believe me that if i ever deal again with an ill-advised and unawakened nature hiding the strength it thinks its weakness i will have long and merciful consideration for it you had for me even for me she answered i quite believe it i said the words you have repeated when my distress was very sharp and hard to bear i say them now for others but i cannot urge them for myself you spoke to me after you had seen and watched me day by day there was great consideration in that you might have spoken perhaps more kindly you might have tried to invite my confidence by greater gentleness but the end would have been the same he shook his head in doubt and not without some inward self-reproach how can i hope she said 
that your interposition would have prevailed with me, when I know how obdurate I was. I never thought at all, dear Mr. Chuzzlewit, I never thought at all. I had no thought, no heart, no care to find one at that time. It has grown out of my trouble. I have felt it in my trouble. I wouldn't recall my trouble such as it is and has been, and it is light in comparison with trials which hundreds of good people suffer every day, I know. I wouldn't recall it to-morrow if I could. It has been my friend, for without it no one could have changed me. Nothing could have changed me. Do not mistrust me because of these tears. I cannot help them. I am grateful for it in my soul. Indeed I am. "'Indeed she is,' said Mrs. Taldgers. "'I believe it, sir.' "'And so do I,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit. "'Now attend to me, my dear. Your late husband's estate, if not wasted by the confession of a large debt to the broken office, which, documents being useless to the runaways, have been sent over to England by them, not so much for the sake of the creditors as for the gratification of their dislike to him, whom they suppose to be still living, will be seized upon by law, for it is not exempt, as I learn, from the claims of those who have suffered by the fraud in which he was engaged. Your father's property was all, or nearly all, embarked in the same transaction. If there be any left, it will be seized on, in like manner. There is no home there. I couldn't return to him, she said, with an instinctive reference to his having forced her marriage on. I could not return to him. I know it, Mr. Chuzzlewit resumed, and I am here because I know it. Come with me. From all who are about me you are certain, I have ascertained it, of a generous welcome. But until your health is re-established, and you are sufficiently composed to bear that welcome, you shall have your abode in any quiet retreat of your own choosing, near London, not so far removed but that this kind-hearted lady may still visit you as often as she pleases. You have suffered much, but you are young, and have a brighter and better future stretching out before you. Come with me. Your sister is careless of you, I know. She hurries on and publishes her marriage in a spirit which, to say no more of it, is barely decent, is unsisterly and bad. Leave the house before her guests arrive. She means to give you pain. Spare her the offence and come with me. Mrs. Todgers, though most unwilling to part with her, added her persuasions. Even poor old Chuffy, of course included in the project, added his. She hurriedly attired herself, and was ready to depart, when Miss Pecksniff dashed into the room. Miss Pecksniff dashed in so suddenly that she was placed in an embarrassing position, for though she had completed her bridal toilette as to her head, on which she wore a bridal bonnet with orange flowers, she had not completed it as to her skirts, which displayed no choicer decoration than a dimity bedgown. She had dashed in a fact about halfway through to console her sister in her affliction with a sight of the aforesaid bonnet, and being quite unconscious of the presence of a visitor until she found Mr. Chuzzlewit standing face to face with her, her surprise was an uncomfortable one. "'So, young lady,' said the old man, eyeing her with strong disfavour, "'you are to be married to-day.' "'Yes, sir,' returned Miss Pecksniff modestly. "'I am. My, my dress is rather really Mrs. Todgers.' "'Your delicacy,' said old Martin, "'is troubled, I perceive. I am not surprised to find it so. You have chosen the period of your marriage unfortunately.' "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Chuzzlewit,' retorted Cherry, very red and angry in a moment, "'but if you have anything to say on that subject, I must beg you to refer to Augustus. You will scarcely think it manly, I hope, to force an argument on me, when Augustus is at all times ready to discuss it with you. I have nothing to do with any deceptions that may have been practised on my parent,' said Miss Pecksniff, pointedly, "'and as I wish to be on good terms with everybody at such a time, I should have been glad if you would have favoured us with your company at breakfast. But I will not ask you as it is, seeing that you have been prepossessed and set against me in another quarter. I hope I have my natural affections for another quarter, and my natural pity for another quarter.' but i cannot always submit to be subservient to it mr chuzzlewit that would be a little too much i trust i have more respect for myself as well as for the man who claims me as his bride 
"'Your sister, meeting, as I think, not as she says, for she has said nothing about it, with little consideration from you, is going away with me,' said Mr. Chuzzlewit. "'I am very happy to find that she has some good fortune at last,' returned Miss Pecksniff, tossing her head. "'I congratulate her, I am sure. I am not surprised that this event shall be painful to her—painful to her. But I can't help that, Mr. Chuzzlewit. It's not my fault.' "'Come, Miss Pecksniff,' said the old man quietly, "'I should like to see a better parting between you. I should like to see a better parting on your side in such circumstances. It would make me your friend. You may want a friend one day or other.' "'Every relation of life, Mr. Chuzzlewit, begging your pardon, and every friend in life,' returned Miss Pecksniff with dignity, "'is now bound up and cemented in Augustus. So long as Augustus is my own, I cannot want a friend. When you speak of friends, sir, I must beg once for all to refer you to Augustus. That is my impression of the religious ceremony in which I am so soon to take a part at that altar to which Augustus will conduct me. I bear no malice at any time, much less in a moment of triumph, towards any one, much less towards my sister. On the contrary, I congratulate her. If you didn't hear me say so, I am not to blame. And I owe it to Augustus to be punctual on an occasion when he may naturally be supposed to be, to be impatient. Really, Mrs. Todgers, I must beg your leave, sir, to retire." After these words the bridal bonnet disappeared with as much state as the dimity bedgown left in it. Old Martin gave his arm to the younger sister without speaking, and led her out. Mrs. Todgers, with her holiday garments fluttering in the wind, accompanied them to the carriage, clung round Mary's neck at parting, and ran back to her own dingy house, crying the whole way. She had a lean, lank body, Mrs. Todgers, but a well-conditioned soul within. Perhaps the good Samaritan was lean and lank and found it hard to live. Who knows? Mr. Chuzzlewit followed her so closely with his eyes that until she had shut her own door they did not encounter Mr. Tapley's face. "'Why, Mark,' he said, as soon as he observed it, "'what's the matter?' "'The wonderfulest it went, sir,' returned Mark, pumping at his voice in a most laborious manner, and hardly able to articulate with all his efforts, "'a coincidence as never was equalled. "'I'm blessed if here ain't two old neighbours of ours, sir.' "'What neighbours?' cried old Martin, looking out of window. "'Where?' "'I was a walking up and down not five yards from this spot,' said Mr. Tapley, breathless, "'and they come upon me like their own ghosts, as I thought they was. "'It's the wonderfulest event that ever happened. "'Bring a feather, somebody, and knock me down with it.' "'What do you mean?' exclaimed old Martin, quite as much excited by the spectacle of Mark's excitement as that strange person was himself. "'Neighbours where?' "'Here, sir,' replied Mr. Tapley, "'here in the city of London, here upon these very stones. Here they are, sir. Don't I know em? Lord love their welcome faces, don't I know em? With what ejaculations Mr. Tapley not only pointed to a decent-looking man and woman standing by, but commenced embracing them alternately over and over again in Monument Yard. "'Neighbours, where?' old Martin shouted, almost maddened by his ineffectual efforts to get out of the coach-door. "'Neighbours in America! Neighbours in Eden!' cried Mark. "'Neighbours in the swamp! Neighbours in the bush! Neighbours in the fever! Didn't she nurse us? Didn't he help us? Shouldn't we both have died without him? Haven't they come a-struggling back without a single child for their consideration? And talk to me of neighbours. Away he went again, in a perfectly wild state, hugging them and skipping round them, and cutting in between them as if he were performing some frantic and outlandish dance. Mr. Chuzzlewit no sooner gathered who these people were than he burst open the coach door somehow or other, and came tumbling out among them as if the lunacy of Mr. Tapley were contagious. He immediately began to shake hands too, and exhibit every demonstration of the liveliest joy. "'Get up behind,' he said. "'Get up in the rumble. Come along with me. Go you on the box, Mark. Home, home.' "'Home,' said Mr. Tapley, seizing the old man's hand in a burst of enthusiasm. "'Exactly my opinion, sir. Home forever. 
"'Excuse the liberty, sir, I can't help it. "'Success to the jolly Tapley. "'There's nothing in the house they shan't have for the asking for except a bill. "'Home to be sure. Hurrah!' "'Home they rolled accordingly, when he had got the old man in again as fast as they could go. "'Mark abating nothing of his fervour, by the way, by allowing it to vent itself as unrestrainedly as if he had been on Salisbury Plain.' and now the wedding party began to assemble at Todgers. Mr. Jenkins, the only boarder invited, was on the ground first. He wore a white favour in his buttonhole, and had a brand-new extra super double-milled blue Saxony dress-coat, that was its description in the bill, with a variety of torturous embellishments about the pockets, invented by the artist to do honour to the day. The miserable Augustus no longer felt strongly even on the subject of Jenkins. He hadn't strength of mind enough to do it. "'Let him come,' he had said, in answer to Miss Pecksniff, which he urged the point. "'Let him come. He has ever been my rock ahead through life. "'Tis meet that he should be there. Ha-ha! <laughs> oh, yes, let Jenkins come.' Jenkins had come with all the pleasure in life, and there he was. For some few minutes he had no companion but the breakfast, which was set forth in the drawing-room with unusual taste and ceremony. But Mrs. Todgers soon joined him, and the bachelor cousin, the hairy young gentleman, and Mr. and Mrs. Spottletoe arrived in quick succession. Mr. Spottletoe honoured Jenkins with an encouraging bow. "'Glad to know you, sir,' he said. "'Give you joy,' under the impression that Jenkins was the happy man. Mr. Jenkins explained. He was merely doing the honours for his friend Model, who had ceased to reside in the house and had not yet arrived. "'Not arrived, sir!' exclaimed Spottletoe, in a great heat. "'Not yet,' said Mr. Jenkins. "'Upon my soul!' cried Spottletoe. "'He begins well. Upon my life and honour this young man begins well. But I should very much like to know how it is that every one who comes into contact with his family is guilty of some gross insult to it. Death! Not arrived yet! Not here to receive us!' The nephew, with the outline of a countenance, suggested that perhaps he had ordered a new pair of boots, and they hadn't come home. "'Don't talk to me of boots, sir,' retorted Spottletoe, with immense indignation. "'He is bound to come here in his slippers, then. He is bound to come here barefoot. Don't offer such a wretched and evasive plea to me on behalf of your friend as boots, sir.' "'He's not my friend,' said the nephew. "'I never saw him.' "'Very well, sir,' returned the fiery Spottletoe. "'Then don't talk to me.' The door was thrown open at this juncture, and Miss Pecksniff entered, tottering, and supported by her three bridesmaids. The strong-minded woman brought up the rear, having waited outside until now for the purpose of spoiling the effect. "'How do you do, ma'am?' said Spottletoe, to the strong-minded woman in a tone of defiance. "'I believe you see Mrs. Spottletoe, ma'am?' The strong-minded woman, with an air of great interest in Mrs. Spottletoe's health, regretted that she was not more easily seen, nature erring, in that lady's case, upon the slim side. "'Mrs. Spottletoe is at least more easily seen than the bridegroom, ma'am,' returned that lady's husband. "'That is, unless he has confined his attentions to any particular part or branch of this family, which would be quite in keeping with its usual proceedings.' "'If you allude to me, sir,' the strong-minded woman began. "'Pray,' interposed Miss Pecksniff, "'do not allow Augustus, at this awful moment of his life and mine, "'to be the means of disturbing that harmony "'which it is ever Augustus's and my wish to maintain. "'Augustus has not been introduced to any of my relations now present. "'He preferred not.' "'Why, then, I venture to assert,' cried Mr. Spottletoe, "'that the man who aspires to join this family, and prefers not to be introduced to its members, is an impertinent puppy. That is my opinion of him.' The strong-minded woman remarked with great suavity that she was afraid he must be. Her three daughters observed aloud that it was shameful. "'You do not know Augustus,' said Miss Pecksniff tearfully. "'Indeed, you do not know him.' "'Augustus is all mildness and humility. "'Wait till you see Augustus, and I am sure he will conciliate your affections.' "'The question arises,' cried Spottletoe, folding his arms, "'how long we are to wait. "'I am not accustomed to wait, that's the fact. "'And I want to know how long we are expected to wait.' "'Mrs. Todgers,' said Charity, "'Mr. Jenkins, I'm afraid there must be some mistake.' I think Augustus must have gone straight to the altar. 
As such a thing was possible, and the church was close at hand, Mr. Jenkins ran off to see, accompanied by Mr. George Chuzzlewit, the bachelor cousin, who preferred anything to the aggravation of sitting near the breakfast without being able to eat it. But they came back with no other tidings than a familiar message from the clerk, importing that if they wanted to be married that morning, they had better look sharp, as the curate wasn't going to wait there all day. The bride was now alarmed, seriously alarmed. Good heavens, what could have happened? Augustus! Dear Augustus! Mr. Jenkins volunteered to take a cab and seek him at the newly furnished house. The strong-minded woman administered comfort to Miss Pecksniff. It was a specimen of what she had to expect. It would do her good. It would dispel the romance of the affair. The red-nosed daughters also administered the kindest comfort. Perhaps he'd come, they said. The sketchy nephew hinted that he might have fallen off a bridge. The wrath of Mr. Spottletoe resisted all the entreaties of his wife. Everybody spoke at once, and Miss Pecksniff, with clasped hands, sought consolation everywhere, and found it nowhere, when Jenkins, having met the postman at the door, came back with a letter which he put into her hand. Miss Pecksniff opened it, uttered a piercing shriek, threw it down upon the ground, and faded away. They picked it up, and crowding round, and looking over one another's shoulders, read in the words and dashes following this communication. Off Gravesend, Clipper, Scooter, Cupid, Wednesday night. Ever injured Miss Pecksniff. Ere this reaches you, the underside will be, if not a corpse, on his way to Van Diemen's land. Send not in pursuit. I never will be taken alive. The burden, three hundred tons per register, forgive if in my distraction I allude to the ship, on my mind, has been truly dreadful. Frequently, when you have sought to soothe my brow with kisses, has self-destruction flashed about me. Frequently, incredible as it may seem, have I abandoned the idea. I love another. She is another's. Everything appears to be somebody else's. Nothing in the world is mine, not even my situation, which I have forfeited by my rash conduct in running away. If you ever loved me, hear my last appeal. The last appeal of a miserable and blighted exile. Forward the enclosed. It is the key of my desk, to the office, by hand. Please address to Bobs and Chalbury, I mean to Chobs and Balbury, but my mind is totally unhinged. I left a penknife, with a buckhorn handle, in your work-box. It will repay the messenger. May it make him happier than ever it did me. Oh, Miss Pecksniff, why didn't you leave me alone? Was it not cruel, cruel? Oh, my goodness, have you not been a witness of my feelings? Have you not seen them flowing from my eyes? Did you not yourself reproach me with weeping more than usual on that dreadful night when last we met in that house where I once was peaceful, though blighted, in the society of Mrs. Todgers? But it was written— in the Talmud, that you should involve yourself in the unscrutable and gloomy fate which it is my mission to accomplish, and which wreathes itself e'en now about in temples. I will not reproach, for I have wronged you. May the furniture make some amends. Farewell. Be the proud bride of a ducal coronet, and forget me. Long may it be before you know the anguish with which I now subscribe myself amid the tempestuous howlings of the sailors. Unalterably, never yours, Augustus. They thought as little of Miss Pecksniff while they greedily perused this letter, as if she were the very last person on earth whom it concerned. But Miss Pecksniff really had fainted away. The bitterness of her mortification— the bitterness of having summoned witnesses, and such witnesses, to behold it, the bitterness of knowing that the strong-minded women and the red-nosed daughters towered triumphant in this hour of their anticipated overthrow, was too much to be borne. Miss Pecksniff had fainted away in earnest. What sounds are these that fall so grandly on the ear? What darkening room is this? and that mild figure seated at an organ who is he ah tom dear tom old friend thy head is prematurely grey though time has passed thee and our old association tom 
but in those sounds with which it is thy wont to bear the twilight company the music of thy heart speaks out the story of thy life relates itself thy life is tranquil calm and happy tom in the soft strain which ever and again comes stealing back upon the ear the memory of thy own love may find a voice perhaps but it is a pleasant softened whispering memory like that in which we sometimes hold the dead and does not pain or grieve thee god be thanked touch the notes lightly tom as lightly as thou wilt but never will thine hand fall half so lightly on that instrument as on the head of thine old tyrant brought down very very low and never will it make as hollow a response to any touch of thine as he does always for a drunken begging squalid letter-writing man called pecksniff with a shrewish daughter haunts thee tom and when he makes appeals to thee for cash reminds thee that he built thy fortunes better than his own and when he spends it entertains the alehouse company with tales of thine ingratitude and his munificence towards thee once upon a time and that he shows his elbows worn in holes and puts his soulless shoes up on a bench and begs his auditors look there while thou art comfortably housed and clothed all known to thee and yet all born with tom so with a smile upon thy face thou passest gently to another measure to a quicker and more joyful one and little feet are used to dance about thee at the sound and bright young eyes to glance up into thine and there is one slight creature tom her child not ruth's whom thine eyes follow in the romp and dance who wondering sometimes to see thee look so thoughtful runs to climb up on thy knee and put her cheek to thine who loves thee tom above the rest if that can be and falling sick once chose thee for her nurse and never knew impatience tom when thou wert by her side thou glidest now into a graver air an air devoted to old friends and bygone times and in thy lingering touch upon the keys and the rich swelling of the mellow harmony they rise before thee the spirit of that old man dead who delighted to anticipate thy wants and never ceased to honour thee is there among the rest repeating with a face composed and calm the words he said to thee upon his bed and blessing thee and coming from a garden tom bestrewn with flowers by children's hands thy sister little ruth as light of foot and heart as in old days sits down beside thee from the present and the past with which he is so tenderly entwined in all thy thoughts thy strain soars onward to the future as it resounds within thee and without the noble music rolling round ye both shuts out the grosser prospect of an earthly parting and uplifts ye both to heaven end of chapter fifty four end of martin chuzzlewit